So, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you all very much for, uh, for coming. Um, great Washington weather. We welcome you to, this, uh, to the Institute of Peace uh, on a rainy morning, uh, a topic that I think will be, uh, will be en enlivening. Well, we, will, we will have a great session here today. Um, I want to welcome those of you who are here for the first time. I talked to a couple people who are here for the first time at the Institute of Peace. Um, uh, my name is Bill Taylor, I'm the Executive Vice President here, um, and I am here to tell you a little bit about the Institute of Peace as it uh, is a host for this discussion of countering violent extremism and the Resolve Network that we're here to talk about here today. Uh, Institute of Peace was uh, started 30 years ago. Um, we focus on conflict, um, and we're talking about violent conflict. So the topic that we're here to talk about here today is very relevant uh, for us. We believe that if we think about this, if we focus on violent conflict, if we, if we do the analysis, um, that we can make some gains on peace. We, we think that peace is possible, that it is practical, that it is important for the United, for the United States as well as the international community. So the, the, the work that you're doing, that we're doing together today to think about the issues must lead to action, it must lead to policies and then to action and then the recycling, then the thinking about what the action has done and see what we need to do next. Um, so that's what the that's what Institute of Peace is doing. I'm very glad to, to have you here. The topic is a big one. Um, 65 million people displaced around the world from conflict. Um, attacks on, on schools, on cafes, on museums um, around the world. What's going on here? Um, why is this happening? This is the kind of question that we, that we would like to, like, like to address. The other question we'd like to address, though, is those communities, there are communities around the world that are not afflicted by or somehow resist this notion of violent extremism. What's going on there? Um, how do we reinforce the resilience of, of these communities? How do we compare those who succumb uh, to violent extremism, those that then are displaced, and those that stay to, to fight it, uh, to resist it? And we don't know. Uh, the problem that we're here today to talk about is, is evidence. We don't have the evidence on which to base the policies, on which to act, um, in order to, to deal with this problem. So you're here, this, we're all here uh, to focus on evidence in the first part of, uh, of, this, of this chain uh, toward action, toward actually moving toward peace. Um, and that is where we get into the Resolve Network. Um, uh, this is, you all are, are focused on this and it's a, it's a good effort. Um, it's the first step. Uh, Resolve, of course, is barely a year old. A year ago, it was a, it was a gleam, a little more than a gleam, but it was an idea. Um, uh, and now it's reality. Now it's reality. Now we need to work on it uh, to, to, to make this work. Um, I would like to turn this over to Georgia Homer, who is the director here at the Institute of Peace um, for our CVE work. Um, and Georgia is going to introduce our, our keynote speaker as well as describe to you what's going on for the rest of the day. So thank you very much for joining us. And Georgia, over to you. Thank you, Bill. And good morning, everyone. Thanks for making it out in this dreary day today. Um, as Bill just outlined for, for you, USIP has made a strong commitment to addressing the understanding of drivers of violent extremism. And USIP is very proud to host the Secretariat of the Resolve Network and help incubate and support this very important initiative. We all know that the cycles of violence that we've seen unfold in Nigeria and Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere are deeply rooted in long-standing dynamics of political and social conflict. The question that many communities around the world will face now is how to interrupt those cycles. And clearly there's no easy one-size-fit-all solution. So the Resolve Network, with its growing community of researchers, practitioners, and policymakers, is really uniquely positioned to help advance our understanding of those local dynamics. Today marks an important milestone for the network. As Bill mentioned, Resolve was launched on the sidelines of last year's UNGA. 
and it's now poised to share a ch shared research agenda and to extend the global community of CVE practice by working with local researchers online and in person to dig deep into the drivers of extremism. And this week, Resolve will launch its new version of its website, which we fully expect will serve as a key hub and a community for information exchange on these complicated issues. Many of the speakers that we have here with us today have first-hand experience in the communities that are facing the challenge of violent extremism. We have researchers from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kenya, Bangladesh, South Africa, Europe, and North America, and they really do represent the cutting edge of research in this field. And as we'll learn in our discussion today, there is some consensus growing around where the gaps are in the research. Geographically speaking, the rise of violent attacks in Nigeria and Bangladesh, in Somalia and Libya and Afghanistan, suggests that research in these countries really needs to be prioritized, and that Tunisia, Mali and Algeria, Kosovo and Kenya also need additional attention. There's also agreement that we don't know enough about the role of the state, of religious actors, and institutions or security actors in shaping community responses to extremism. We don't know enough about the feedback loop between intergenerational migration and displacement, violent conflict, and extremism. Resolve hopes to fill some of these critical gaps in our understanding. But as we'll hear from our keynote speaker, Mohammed Hafez, in a few minutes, we do know that the evolution of groups like Daesh and Al-Qaeda is long and complex. Dr. Hafez is an associate professor and chairman of the National Security Affairs Department at the Naval Postgraduate School, who's written extensively on extremism and political Islam. In addition to his case studies in Algeria and Egypt, featured in Why Muslims Rebel, he has explored the motives and strategic logic of suicide bombers in a book on Iraq published by USIP. We are very thrilled to have him here today and look forward to his address, which is provocatively titled, Of Barrel Bombs and Beheadings, the Roots of Intergenerational Extremism. Please join me in welcoming Mohammed Afez. Thank you, Georgia, for a very nice uh, introduction. And I want to thank Candice, thank the United States Institute of Peace and the Resolve Network for giving me this great opportunity to be here today to exchange ideas and to be among distinguished scholars, ambassadors, uh, practitioners, and so on. So I really am grateful for the opportunity. I'm flattered. And um, I think the weather is somehow appropriate for the topic that we're talking about today. Uh, gloomy and overcast is uh, really going to perhaps be the theme throughout this uh, day. Um, two years ago, I met a Lebanese colonel who was dealing with the Arsal crisis. Arsal is a town in northeast uh, Lebanon that borders on Syria. And in August 2014, ISIS uh, made an attempt to take it over. Uh, fortunately, it, was, uh, it failed. It was pushed back after five days of battle. And um, uh, the colonel that I uh, uh, met uh, was quite chatty and animated. Uh, he was a bit you know, nervous. You could tell he was betraying his nervousness about what's happening to his country and to the region. Uh, and of course, uh, he has, uh, or he had every right to be nervous. Um, if we look at uh, Lebanon by that time was flooded with Syrian refugees. ISIS in 2014 was at the height of its power. And the hopeful Arab Spring by then had turned into a bleak Arab winter. And uh, we had civil wars in Syria, Iraq, um, Yemen, and Libya, and uh, instability elsewhere. In the course of our conversations, he said something that informs the title of this presentation. He said that Arab citizens today are trapped between barrel bombs and beheadings. He said it in Arabic, بَيْنَ الْبَرَمِيلُ وَالسَّكَاكِينَ What he meant by that was that Arab citizens today are trapped of, between the barrel bombs of Bashar al-Assad that he hurls on his own people with devastating effect, just as what we're seeing in Aleppo in the last few days, and the savage beheadings of ISIS uh, that are there out for the world to see, uh, usually filmed for the world to view. But what he was really saying is that people in the Middle East today, in the Arab world uh, more generally, have no choice but to support despotic regimes or succumb to fanatical extremism. He viewed the problem as a choice between two tragic options, either Assad 
or ISIS. Today, I will argue that this is not only a false choice, it is one manufactured by regimes enduring a crisis of legitimacy in order to maintain their grip on power. State coercive practices and violent extremism are two sides of the same coin. Rather than a choice between, say, Sisi and ISIS, Sisi and ISIS are two sides of the same coin. Arab states have been confronting an enduring crisis of legitimacy, one rooted in their failure to establish good governance, transcend authoritarian rule, and project military strength. This triple failure of Arab states has resulted in regimes relying on manipulation, coercion, and outright repression than on legitimate authority that can inspire confidence in their rule. Part of this strategy has been to purposely hollow out the moderate middle in order to present their populations and their Western allies a choice between despotism and extremism. In reality, these seemingly polar opposites depend on one another. Both thrive when the moderate middle is marginalized and society is polarized. This is the root of intergenerational extremism in the Arab world. Now, I know that violent extremism has many causes and cannot be reduced to a single explanation. And as we move far away from the Arab world, we will undoubtedly encounter different drivers of extremism. What is unique in the Arab world, however, are the depth, pervasiveness, and persistence of extremism. Just as importantly, perhaps, the Arab world has become the, main, the mothership that dispatches a great deal of extremism around the world. Uh, the ideology of extremism, the tactics of extremism, and the networks of extremists. Containing and defeating violent extremism around the globe cannot succeed when a major region of the world serves as a vector for future generations for radicalization. Here's how I will, how I will proceed today. First, I will pose a puzzle. Why, after 35 years since the Iranian Revolution and 15 years since 9-11, is the challenge of radical Islamism more acute than ever? Why, after so much resources and so much effort dedicated to countering violent extremism, the problem today is worse, not better? Next, I'm going to pose couple of hypotheses that commonly are given to explain the endurance of extremism in the Arab world. Now, while I don't necessarily disagree with these hypotheses, I will argue that they miss something deeper, something structural. And that will be the third part of my presentation today, where I will describe the crisis of legitimacy that pervades the Arab world and make the case for how regimes that are unable to establish structural and institutional legitimacy which are rooted in good governance, rule of law, and respect for human rights, these governments are relying on coercive practices that disincentivize moderation and incentivize radicalization. And I will conclude with a message to the Resolve Network. I will say to you that our challenge is not only an empirical one, it is also one of imagination. It is not enough to, it's not sufficient to dedicate our energies and resources toward more studies to figure out why people are radicalizing. We need plenty of bold and creative recommendations for going beyond false choices and failed strategies in our effort to counter the roots of violent extremism. So let me begin with a puzzle. The 1979 Iranian Revolution marked the ascendancy of Islamism. Now, Iran is not an Arab country, but certainly it did inspire a lot of Islamist movements in the Arab world as well as around, much, uh, around all of the Muslim world. Now, the Iranian revolution marked the ascendancy of political Islamism, and the attacks of 9-11 marked the extremization of Islamic radicalism. Since those two seminal milestones, radicals and extremists have faced an oppositional onslaught from local, 
regional and international forces. There was a war in Afghanistan, a war in Iraq, and a war on terrorism. The, these wars were waged by a superpower with tremendous financial, military, and intelligence assets, and one that marshaled local and international allies to be able to defeat extremism. We have dedicated over $100 billion to bolstering the security capabilities of the Afghan and Iraqi forces and provided similar levels of support to various countries in Africa and South Asia. Yet today, violent extremism and Islamist movements is at an all-time high. A quick glance at the map of the MENA, the Middle East and North Africa, if we look at that map, it will reveal significant levels of violence from the Maghreb to the Mashrek. Algeria has AQIM, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Tunisia and Libya have Ansar al-Sharia and ISIS. Egypt has Ansar Bayt al-Maqdis, which is now ISIS. Yemen has the Houthis and Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Iraq and Syria have ISIS and the Nusra Front, which recently changed its name. Indeed, more than a third of Arab states are facing some form of Islamist violence. All this leads to the puzzle. Why, after three decades dealing with Islamist movements, after all our collective experiences, our efforts, and our human and material resources, why did the arc of Islamism bend in the direction of radicalization and extremism? Instead of containing the movement through a simultaneous process of institutionalizing moderation and containing and ultimately suppressing extremism, we have the opposite occur. Radicalism is on the rise and moderation is in retreat. Why? So let me consider a couple of explanations. There are actually a lot of explanations out there and when I started this, Candace gave me the guidance. I should try to keep this in 25 minutes. So I decided to go after the two most common, I think, plausible explanations of why uh, extremism persists, but then I will offer my own. And these two explanations are what could be called the systemic explanation and the other one would be the strategic opportunities explanation. The most common one is the systemic argument, which is that missteps by hegemonic powers have empowered extremism by removing the sources of stability, principally strong men, and altering the delicate balance of power in the Middle East subsystem. Such steps have unleashed regional competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran, accompanied by a sectarian discourse on both sides to the benefit of extremists. Missteps such as the ill-advised interventions in Iraq and Libya, or the opposite argument that the hasty disengagement created a vacuum for extremism, whether you know, disengagement from Afghanistan after the Soviets left in 1989, or disengagement in Iraq in 2011, and we didn't take the oil, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Libya, uh, disenga or disengagement in Libya after the toppling of Gaddafi. It is perhaps appropriate to say at this point that the views expressed today are my own. They do not reflect my institution or that of the US government for which I work. Now the logical conclusion of this argument is that we must do everything in our power to restore an equilibrium based on strong men and powerful security sectors to control the chaos. We must reject Pollyannish nation building projects. As one Washington pundit put it, we cannot transform, we can only transact. This sort of thinking has led to the excessive securitization of the war on terrorism. We have adopted a largely security-centric approach, relying on boots on the ground and drones in the air, while merely paying lip service to the other dimensions of countering radicalization and extremism including good governance, development, human rights, rule of law, and conflict resolution. Now this is a credible argument and warrants serious consideration. No one can doubt that the US invasion of Iraq in 2003 and NATO's intervention in Libya in 2011 have created opportunities for extremists to exploit. However, this argument ignores the mass carnage and instability in places where intervention did not occur. Take Algeria during the 1990s and its civil war that led to over 200,000 deaths 
and you know, thousands have displaced and disappeared. Look at Syria today, where intervention, although there is a kind of intervention, but it's certainly not the robust intervention of regime change that this argument points to. We could add to the list Sudan, Somalia, and Yemen. These are all places that, you know, equivalents of hell on earth in, in, in some ways without really major uh, Western intervention in them. The fact is, extremism seems to thrive with or without Western interventions. And while Western interventions have proven to be destabilizing at times, the current instability in the Arab world has a more proximate cause, which is the Arab Spring revolutions, which cannot be attributed to Western meddling. And as for the militarization of counterviolent extremism, this argument assumes that local regimes are willing to cooperate with Western efforts to promote good governance, advance human rights and rule of law, and resolve deep-seated conflicts. Attempts to transform polities and improve governing institutions require receptivity from ruling elites. In some places, such aid and assistance was welcomed, but in others, it is viewed with suspicion and indeed rejected as undue interference or outright subversion precisely because it empowers oppositional forces. Now, the other explanation, the other plausible explanation is that of the strategic act or the strategic opportunities argument, which is to say that jihadists control their own agency and have been quite good at exploiting opportunities when they arise. They scale up their recruitment when conditions are permissive, and they scale down their activities when they are confronted with constraints. They articulate powerful narratives and disseminate them online and through social media. They have also created a culture of jihadism that is intrinsically appealing to young alienated men and increasingly women. In other words, the persistence of extremism has less to do with the strategies and policies of local governments and their Western allies, and more to do with how jihadists interact and exploit shifts in opportunity structures. So an example of this would be ISIS. So ISIS, before it was ISIS, it was the Islamic State of Iraq, and at the height of its power in 2006, um, it was confronted by a U.S. surge, confronted by a tribal awakening, and that effort over a period of time shrunk its activities and it ceased to be a major insurgent group and became more of a sort of vexatious terrorist organization with major bombings. And it was mainly up in the north around Mosul and other parts. It was driven out of Anbar and elsewhere. But when the U.S. left in 2011 and when the Arab, Springs, uh, Arab Spring uh, took place and, and turned into a civil war in Syria, ISIS seized that opportunity, was able to uh, expand on it and scale up its activities again. So the logical extension of, the, of this argument is that we should do everything possible to address the enabling environments of extremism, such as the diffusion of nonviolent but extreme networks, illicit traffickers, vulnerable communities, social media, and so on. This means we have to be more contextual, not global, in our approach to countering violent extremism. Find where are the vectors that where extremists can exploit, and let's target those vectors and hopefully deprive them opportunities there. Now, I, I accept that extremists behave strategically and exploit local opportunities to grow their ranks, but this does not explain the scale, scope, and magnitude of extremism in the Arab world today. Again, one-third of these states have an extremism problem in some form or another. Also, this argument may explain why we have extremism, say, in Iraq and Syria, but it doesn't explain the thousands of young men and women, uh, lesser or much fewer women, come to fight as foreign fighters in those conflict zones. They come from Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, just to name a few. The interconnected nature of extremism in the Arab world, the fungibility and mobility of extremists across conflict zones, suggests that we need to view this as a systemic problem, not just local or context-bound. 
So now let me give you my view, and I, let me just say that I actually agree with these two explanations, but I think there's something deeper going on, particularly if one is seeking to explain the endurance of this. You know, we're looking at nearly 40 years now since the Iranian Revolution, and, you know, we've had the civil wars, and we've had the insurgencies, and counterinsurgencies, and so on, and yet the problem persists. To explain the persistence of the problem, I think we need to go a bit deeper, deeper in our analysis. So, to explain why so many young men are volunteering as willing martyrs in the ranks of violent extremism, and why this problem persists despite our concerted efforts, we have to look to the structural, structural drivers of extremism. And I argue that the enduring crisis of legitimacy has created fertile soil for jihadi roots to take, to take root, or for jihadi roots to grow and grow and grow again. To start, it is important to delineate what is state legitimacy. States could potentially draw their legitimacy from three sources of authority. There is traditional authority, such as tribal and religious authority, which is what we see in some of the Gulf countries relying on tri uh, tribal customs and patrimonial systems, and that's sort of the, the tribal tradition, and that's a source of authority for some of those states. And as for the religious authority, we see the Alawite monarchy in Morocco or the Hashemite uh, monarchy uh, kingdom in Jordan. Those would be way, exp uh, ways that people could draw legitimacy from tribal or religious sources. Then there is ideological authority that I get to rule because I have an ideological vision of our society and I want to promote that and that vision is good, not just for my society, indeed for the world. So think of the Iranian revolution advancing of an ideological vision where Islam reigns supreme in, uh, in, in society. Uh, think of uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt advancing the notion of pan-Arab unity, pan-Arab unity being the ideal that would uh, um, redeem the mistakes of the earlier generations that divided up the Arab world. Or Boumedien and the FLN after uh, their war of liberation against the French advanced third worldism, decolonization, and that was a source of legitimacy for that elite. And of course, the Soviet Union advancing communism as an ideology. So ideological authority could be a source of legitimacy for some states. But another way that states could, de uh, could derive authority and legitimacy is through structural and institutional authority, based on a set of agreed upon political institutions or the deliverance of good governance as part of a social compact between the governed and the governing. In the modern world, traditional authority tends to wane, and ideological authority tends to have a short shelf life. Just ask the Iranian uh, youth that are born after the Iranian revolution. They're not necessarily as inspired by Vilayat al-Faqih as maybe uh, the, uh, the earlier generations. In any case, both of these forms of, uh, of uh, legitimacy, whether ideological or traditional uh, authority, have to be supplanted by or at least supplemented with structural and institutional authority to be viewed uh, as legitimate. This means that states are legitimate when they are perceived to be acting in the common interest, provide personal security, political rights, economic goods, and abide by the rule of law, and their general publics have confidence in their ruling elites, political parties, governing institutions, economic systems, and civil service. Absent state legitimacy rooted in structural and institutional authority, elites have to rely on coercion and coercive measures to maintain their rule. If you cannot rule by consent, you have to rule by force. States will devote more resources to coerce and coercive measures that range from electoral manipulation, elite fragmentation, side payments for co-optation, coup proofing, surveillance, and social control, to the more harsh measures or the harsher measures such as curtailment of civil liberties, massive human rights violations, and indiscriminate repression. So how does this all relate to the Arab world and to extremism in the Arab world? My argument is that in the post-independence period, 
Arab states have sought to build their legitimacy on the basis of traditional and ideological authority, but have not succeeded in transitioning towards structural and institutional authority rooted in voice and accountability, effective governance or government effectiveness, regulatory quality, rule of law, and control of corruption. In other words, according to the key measures of good governance used by the World Bank's worldwide governance indicators, the MENA region suffers from a good governance deficit, which in turn translates to lack of confidence in ruling regimes. So here's what I did. I went to that website, the Worldwide Governance Indicators. It's beautiful. You should go to it. And I looked at the data for 2010. Now, the data was collected from 2005, and the last data set is 2015. So I took the midpoint, 2010, and that was also the year that preceded the Arab Springs. And I wanted to see how did the MENA region as a whole, which includes oil-rich countries as well as oil-poor and, and failed and weak states, as a whole, MENA, how does it compare to the OECD countries, the high-income countries, but also to mid-level or lower-income uh, countries, mainly Latin America? So those were my three data points. <clears throat> and I looked at those and the various measures uh, that uh, constitute good governance. In all the major areas of voice and accountability, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, rule of law, and control of corruption, in all those measures, in all those measures uh, of good governance, MENA lagged behind not, on the high, not only on the high income countries, but also Latin America, many of which are lower middle income states. High income countries tended to be in the 88th percentile or near there, while uh, Latin America was in the 50th to 60th percentile. MENA region was in the high 40s. Now, there is one exception. When it comes to voice and accountability, MENA states were ranked in the 23rd percentile, not even half of where Latin America is. In summary, Arab states have a long way to go in the key measures of good governance. A region that should have benefited tremendously from the global energy boom of the 1990s and 2000s is entering an era of energy oversupply with a poor set of governing institutions. There's one more area in which Arab states do not inspire the confidence of their populations. I'm referring to their military feebleness. Despite spending 5.5% of its GDP between 2001 and 2010, which is more than double the world average of 2.5 of GDP, the MENA region offers its public little by way of military performance whether it is in the regional wars that it wages or protection of its territorial sovereignty, or Arab states are not known for their military prowess. Their dependence on external power is a source of embarrassment, and reliance on proxy actors often adds fuel to the fire, especially when accompanied by sectarian discourse. The provision of internal security tends to be better, but it is often done with heavy handedness and with little respect for human rights. So when it comes to the most critical functions of the modern state, protection of its territorial sovereignty and provision of internal security, Arab regimes have underperformed their regional rivals and even sub-state actors, further calling into question their legitimacy. These are the conditions that have allowed Islamism to emerge and persist as a serious challenger to secular nationalist elites. Confronted with such major oppositional movement, regimes turn to outright repression or selective co-optation of Islamists, not just the radical sort, but also the nonviolent and centrist ones. By doing so, they either suppressed the moderate middle or co-opted its ideological message without seeding any real problems thus creating room for radicals to step in with an uncompromising vision of society. The ideological pillars of ISIS today, which are territorial revisionism, uncompromising Islamism, and merciless violence, are nothing less than a counter-hegemonic move targeting the three vulnerabilities of Arab states today, weak governance, repressive authoritarianism, and military feebleness. It is not difficult to see how some young Arab men 
will find in this radical narrative appealing. I see that I need to conclude. Permit me just two more minutes, and I promise it'll be worth your time. <laughs> the year 1979 was a fateful year. That was the year of the Iranian Revolution, marking the ascendancy of political Islamism. It was also the year that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, which inspired a certain young man to come to the aid of the Afghan Mujahideen and eventually changed history for the worse on 9-11. It is interesting that 1979 was also the year of a famous satirical Arab play called Kasak Ya Watan, which translates roughly to Cheers to the Homeland. In that play, the Syrian actor Dured Laham, who goes by the stage name of Ghawar, is naively optimistic about the future of his country. His wife gives birth to their daughter, Ahlam, which is Arabic for dreams. His newborn, however, dies a few months later, after she couldn't get medical attention she needed because the doctor in the hospital was preoccupied with a VIP patient who was suffering from erectile dysfunction. Rawar, depressed, takes up drinking after he could not get answers to why his dreams had died. The final scene in the play trenchantly captures the crisis of legitimacy that I have spoken about today. An inebriated Ghawar receives a call from heaven. It is his dead father who was martyred for the pan-Arab nationalist cause. His father wants to know what has happened to all the sacrifices of his generation. He begins by asking, tell me my son, what is the state of Arab unity today? Are you unified in one big country? A drunken Ghawar replies, well, father, today I had breakfast in Baghdad, lunch in Khartoum, and I'm speaking to you now from Abu Dhabi. A pleased father asks a follow-on question. What happened to the prisons and the detention centers? Ghawar laughs and says, we turned them into schools and hospitals. What about social justice, my son? Ghawar replies, foreigners from all over the world come to marvel at our system of justice and rule of law. We've become a tourist destination. Tell me, my son, the father asks, what happened to Palestine? Did you return it to its rightful owners? Ghawar, a bit crestfallen by now, parries the question by asking, how could you ask such a question after 30 years of struggle? Feeling reassured, the father says, well, my son, it looks like you, didn't, you don't need anything down there. An inebriated Ghawar replies with a bit of sober truth. No, father, we don't need anything except perhaps a bit of dignity. That's all. Nearly four decades since the famous play, the Arab world is no closer to regional stability, good governance, and inclusive polities. Things are getting worse, not better. The persistence and endurance of extremism, its pervasiveness and trajectory in the wrong direction, must force us to go beyond mere technical analysis or academic analysis or a narrow focus on local contexts that drive extremism. We have to step back and look at the big picture and ask why does a group with a fraction of our resources, intelligence capabilities, and network of allies why such a group can inspire thousands to join its caravan of death and destruction. If you agree with me that the structural roots of extremism have to do with a deficit in building legitimate state authority on the one hand, and excessive reliance on coercive state practices on the other, then we cannot limit the power of our collective intellect to small solutions in the name of realism and pragmatism. We need to dedicate our energies to imagine an alternative future for those struggling with extremism and conceive bold and ambitious solutions that can bend the arc of Islamism toward moderation and peaceful integration and beyond barrel bombs and beheadings. Thank you.
thank you very much, Dr. Hafez, for that very astute analysis and for underscoring the issues of legitimacy and governance that are critical to this problem set. It's actually a perfect lead-in to our first panel, which is going to be talking specifically about governance issues. But first, we invite you to a brief coffee break um, out in the forum. So please have a cup of coffee, um, process your thoughts, and please come back at 10.20. 10.20. Thank you.
be getting down beyond the theory, beyond the research, and really ground-truthing some of these assumptions and questions that we are having around uh, the CVE problem. Um, governance is a word and a topic uh, and, and an area of inquiry that comes up very commonly in this field. Uh, and it's something that each person on the stage uh, has spent years uh, looking into. Uh, they have experience around the world, uh, and what we're going to be doing over the next about hour is digging into their real practical world experience. Um, I think that uh, the organizer, organizers uh, invited me to sort of herd these cats uh, in a way that is engaging, but also because of some of the outcomes of the work that my organization has been doing. My name is Cameron Chisholm, by the way, I'm the, I'm the president of the International Peace and Security Institute. Uh, we ran a similar uh, uh, CVE event that I think I see many faces here uh, that I saw there, uh, where we tried to break down the silos uh, and really understand where is the future of CVE. And what we found coming out of that, which was interesting, was that 86% of the individuals in the room, the, by far the majority, uh, thought that inclusive governance was the most effective way to counter violent extremism. Uh, when we look at the way that the uh, international organizations as well as uh, militaries focus on this uh, particular uh, subset of topics, the funding doesn't necessarily match up with what we all collectively thought is the most effective. Uh, but governance itself is a loaded term. Um, uh, Dr. Hafez uh, explained it well, uh, and we sort of joked afterwards that well, we don't really have anything to say at this point because he's right. All of this intersects. <laughs> Rule of law, governance, uh, uh, and, and uh, society, civil society, all of these interact in a way that builds local systems that are resilient enough to uh, withstand the push and pull of violent extremists. Uh, that's easy to talk about at the 40,000 foot level. What we're going to try and do is get granular. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, the esteemed panel next to me. Uh, and uh, then I hand it over to them. Each of them will speak for about five to seven minutes. Uh, I'm going to facilitate a conversation uh, for about 15, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A for 20 minutes, uh, because there is just as much knowledge uh, in the room as there is up here. Uh, and so hopefully we can create a robust conversation uh, in the process. Uh, so first, I would like to introduce Beza Tesafaye. Uh, she is the Conflict and Governance Research Manager at Mercy Corps. Uh, and oversees uh, the portfolio of research uh, studies centered on youth and violence. Uh, she recently wrote a report uh, entitled Investing in Iraq's Peace, How Good Governance Can Diminish Support for Violent Extremism. And she's going to be uh, digging into that as well as a little bit on Somalia. Uh, second, we have Ambassador Humayan Kabir. Uh, he's the Vice President of the Bangladesh Enterprise Institute in Dhaka. Uh, he's a career dip diplomat for 30 years and is the former ambassador to the United States from Bangladesh. He's currently working with youth at the national level in Bangladesh on CVE. Uh, then we have Cheryl Frank. Uh, she's the division head for transnational threats and international crime division at the Inst Institute for Security Studies in Pretoria. Uh, she really focuses on rule of law, development, crime, and violence prevention, as well as crime victimization, child justice, child protection, and restorative justice. So all of the pieces that fit into good governance. Uh, and finally, we have Richard Atwood, uh, who's the Multilateral Affairs Director at the International Crisis Group, uh, and he's the head of the New York office. Uh, he focuses on transnational threats, peace operations, and political transitions. Uh, he also sounds really smart because he's British, uh, and so everything <laughs> that comes out of his mouth just seems a little bit smarter than the rest of us. Um, so, <laughs> so that's last. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to ask a question first, and I'm going to head it over to, to Beza. Um, and that question is, why does governance matter in understanding the push and pull of radicalization to violent extremism? Uh, OK, thank you, Cameron. And, and good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm especially honored to be part of this very impressive panel. Uh, so the topic that we've been asked to speak on, uh, the links between governance and violent extremism, is, is something of uh, importance to the work that I do. Uh, so I wanted to share a few thoughts based on my experience at Mercy Corps, where, as Cameron mentioned, I oversee a portfolio of research on violent extremism um, and touch a little bit on the, the issue of governance. As many of you know, uh, just as a formality, Mercy Corps is an international organization. We work in over 40 different countries. 
And in recent years, we've been conducting field-based research to understand what are the drivers of violent extremism, and relatedly, what are some of the ways in which we can address those drivers effectively. And a very common denominator that's come up in our research is the important role that injustice plays in driving people to engage in violent extremism, and we've seen this across the board. Um, and then, conversely, we've also begun to see that governance can play a big role in addressing some of those injustice-based grievances. So, in the short amount of time that I have, I quickly want to go over two research studies that sort of demonstrate through empirical um, evidence uh, how exactly governance can help reduce support for violent extremism. So the first study uh, I wanted to touch on is called Investing in Iraq's Peace, How Good Governance Can Reduce Support for Violent Extremism. And it's a study that we conducted in Iraq um, around 2014, 2015. Um, as background, Mercy Corps has been working in Iraq and between 2013 and 2015 we've been conducting nationally representative public opinion polls um, on citizens' perceptions of governance, their views uh, on civil society, and even their um, level of support <coughs> for armed opposition groups. Now, in 2014, as we were in the middle of our second public opinion survey, um, something unexpected happened. Um, the Prime Minister, of, at the time Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, had resigned uh, under intense international pressure. Uh, and as many of you will recall, Maliki was sort of seen by many as uh, being unable to deal with the threat of violent extremism in the country. And he was also blamed by many as having stoked tensions with uh, the, the Sunni community in Iraq which then led this crisis of, of legitimacy for the government in many of those Sunni-dominated areas that then fell into the hands of, of ISIS. So because um, Maliki's resignation occurred right in the middle of our survey, just randomly, uh, we were able to look at whether that resignation had any kind of impact on people's support for armed opposition groups. And what we found was really, really amazing. So we saw that across the country after Maliki resigned, support for armed opposition groups such as ISIS had, had actually fallen. Uh, but what was most interesting is that this reduction was most significant amongst Iraqi Sunnis. So we saw that support fell from 49% to 26% amongst uh, Sunnis. And as I mentioned, this was a largely representative survey across uh, Iraq at, at that time. Sorry. Um, so this, the second study that I wanted to, to highlight uh, is one that we're just wrapping up now in Somalia, and we're hoping to launch that next month. Um, and whereas the Iraq study was looking more at macro-level governance reforms or macro-level governance changes, the Somalia study is really focused on micro-level governance interventions and how that affects people's attitudes and support for, for armed groups and violent extremism. Uh, so specifically, what we wanted to know is if we introduced civic engagement activities in secondary schools for young people, uh, does that have any kind of effect on their level of support for, for violent extremist groups like Al-Shabaab? Um, and what we found was that just by being in school, simply being in school, uh, secondary education actually increased support for political violence. And that, to me, is not so surprising because a lot of times educated youth have higher expectations uh, when it comes to getting a livelihood or having a voice in politics. And when those expectations are raised but not met, these people, young people, can be drawn into violent extremist groups that use violence against the state. So education, is, in a sense, can be um, a, a threatening thing. Uh, but once we introduced civic engagement for those secondary school youth, we actually saw that the support for political violence went down. And the reason for this, our survey sort of revealed, is because uh, young people saw that they had the ability to change things through nonviolent means rather than through violence. And so civic engagement sort of increased their belief in the efficacy of nonviolence and being able to um, you know, get the changes that they desired to see. Um, so just to conclude, because I think my time is almost out, 
essentially what our research is telling us is that governance does matter and we are beginning to see that some types of reforms or interventions can actually shift attitudes towards uh, less support for violent extremism. Um, and importantly, we also see that these types of reforms have to take place both at the macro level through more um, expansive political reforms, but also at the micro level through activities that engage people um, in civic life, uh, such as civic engagement, community action, mobilization campaigns. Um, and the last thing I guess to mention is that although we're very encouraged by the research that we've been doing and the results that we found, this research is still really nascent. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to be done and a lot of um, questions and gaps that remain in, in terms of really being able to understand how we can effectively address governance and, and violent extremism. So I'll leave it there and happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cameron. Uh, I think. I should begin by thanking the USIP for hosting the Resolve meeting here and inviting me to come over here. And uh, it will, I must say that yesterday and today I'm looking forward to having a stimulating and exciting discussion. Uh, now, the issue of governance that has been the focus of discussion of this session. In Bangladesh, uh, I think we have recently come to the international attention for a uh, wrong reason. Uh, although we have a uh, lot of good uh, stories to tell uh, in terms of uh, you know, sustained economic growth, women empowerment, uh, robust civil society, uh, participation in global peace building and so on and so forth. But we must admit that uh, the recent incidents, particularly for the last one and a half years, uh, have, been, uh, have been difficult for us. And Bangladesh is now seen as a country on the front line of uh, extremist violence. Uh, now, I have been working uh, from our institute, which is Bangladesh Enterprise Institute, for the last uh, five years, roughly. In 28 of 64 districts in Bangladesh, and mostly working with the school, college, and madrasa students. And what we are seeing, the young generation is looking at, uh, the governance is affecting, or lack of governance, or deficits in governance uh, is affecting them uh, uh, quite hard. And that is what that, that worries us in the sense that if the young, young generation is uh, losing faith on the system, then the problems could come down the line. Uh, we, when we walk, we talk to the younger generation, and they are picked by a couple of things, and all are related to the governance issues. One issue that we see common among all these uh, young people around the country is that they are really nervous and concerned about the growing level of violence. And in Bangladesh, what we are seeing is that the recent violent extremist activities have been a kind of continuation or graduation of the level of violence during the last, say, five, 10 years' time. So when they say that they are really concerned about violence, and then it becomes a point of concern for us because our history is saying that this kind of trend of violence can lead to uh, radicalization in the first place and then into extremist violence. So that is one thing that the younger people are telling us, uh, which we believe that this is a part of the problem. The second uh, feedback that we are getting is, has just been mentioned, is that uh, the lack of justice or impunity, uh, that is also affecting them quite hard. And they feel that, uh, that the, the space for getting justice is getting depleted pretty fast. So that is again another issue that comes up and that, that gives us some degree of concern. The third area where governance problem is most uh, acutely manifested is the issue of corruption. Uh, for example, the young people tell us that can we get a job 
without giving bribes. Uh, so that means that this is an issue that bothers them a, a great deal. And they feel uh, picked by two counts. Number one is if they don't pay bribes, for example, not in all cases, but in many cases, uh, that they may be deprived of their rightful space uh, or opportunity. And on the other hand, they see that somebody who is not qualified is getting the job because of their different kinds of connections and linkages. So this is, uh, these, some, these are some of the issues that we are seeing that, uh, that uh, young people are really concerned about. With regard to the, uh, 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 the violent activi extremist activities, what we are seeing is whenever, if we look at the history, 45 year history of Bangladesh, we can see that whenever the governance loses steam, then the violence in different variety, it may be leftist, uh, uh, left oriented violence, for example, in the 70s, early 70s, or the right variety, what we are seeing now, can spike. And just after our independence uh, in the early 70s, the, governance, uh, the, the government started with a good footing, huge popular support, and then as they started losing their uh, standing in, uh, in the eyes of the people, then the alternative, the young people started to look forward to an alternative ideology or alternative course. And at that time, in the early 70s, it was a leftist kind of extremist activities. Then, uh, next time in 2005, 2006, when the last government came and then they started to lose uh, or their grip on, the, on power and started engaging in questionable uh, kind of policy and activities, then we saw in 2004, 5, then it, again it spiked. And now we are seeing for the last one and a half years, initially as a targeted killings, and recently on July 1st uh, at Holy Artisan Cafe in Gulshan where a uh, number of foreigners were killed and also Bangladeshis were killed in that kind of incident. So what we are seeing as a kind of trend is that whenever the governance uh, uh, started to falter, then people start looking for an alternative. And has been mentioned by uh, Mr. Hafiz that legitimacy is a very important issue. Now, legitimacy is not a static idea. It is a dynamic uh, kind of process. So a government which can come to power with a legitimate election, having a, a landslide even mandate, but if they start losing their co way or their steam, then the, 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 the people started to uh, get alienated from them. And particularly this happens with the younger people. Uh, we are in a transitional society like many other societies. And in a transitional society, the young people particularly aspire more. And the younger generation, particularly what we see at the grassroots level in Bangladesh, uh, they are quite different from uh, the previous generation. And they, they want more, uh, they are more connected, uh, their aspiration is higher and they expect more from the government and look for better opportunities. And if those are not available or in any way obstructed, then they get frustrated, then alienated, and if they are humiliated, then I think the enabling environment is created for them to look for an alternative thought process, alternative ideology, and eventually alternative kind of course. And that comes very handy in a Muslim majority country. For example, in a, in, a, in, a, in a Bangladeshi context particularly, we have a nice blend of two, I say, identity chromosomes. One is the culture, another is the religion. So they are finely blended. And whenever there is a problem, or whenever one is pushed hard, the other tends to come back and uh, uh, take the, uh, uh, or, or occupy the minds of the people. So we need to work in a very fine balance. And here in Bangladesh, in recent years, we are seeing that when the government, or I would say government with secular uh, views, government, uh, when the, whenever the governance started, uh, starts to uh, falter, the, and people uh, gets alienated, and then 
they try to find out an alternative or take recourse to an alternative ideology. And that's what we saw uh, uh, recently in, in Gulshan on 1st of July. But here I should also mention that, that uh, uh, legitimacy is a very important issue, as what has been mentioned. Governance is another issue. And it has the governance has to also be inclusive and dynamic. And if it is not inclusive and dynamic, then the problem can start. And then against that kind of environment, the, the extremist elements can either borrow a national banner or brand or an international banner or brand as we have seen in recent incident in Bangladesh. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for this opportunity to speak on this panel. Um, I thought I would um, use this time to reflect um, on our global governance framework, the UN counterterrorism strategy, and particularly our experiences in Africa on how that has played out um, in terms of the the response to violent extremism and uh, the understanding of government uh, uh, of violent extremism. Um, I just wanted to say also that this, um, you know, the UNCT strategy has just been reviewed. It has had a 10-year review. It includes great principles like human rights and the rule of law. It includes concepts around prevention. Um, and. Um, and last week in the, at the UN, um, in those discussions, there was a lot of pessimism about the massive gap between what is in that strategy uh, and what is actually implemented in reality. Uh, and so I'm reflecting on this from our experiences as the Institute for Security Studies in our work in uh, East Africa and the Horn, West Africa and the Sahel, particularly uh, around um, supporting governments to promote um, these rights-based responses to violent extremism. Um, and, um, and many of the organizations involved in the Resolve Network have produced a lot of evidence over the last 10 years. Um, and what we've seen is a, a lot of signif significantly alarming trends. Um, and for example, the use of force and violence as a first option, uh, and the many cycles of violence that result from that, um, you know, revenge attacks, uh, and those, those sorts of um, patterns. Um, we've seen limited effective use of criminal justice and rule of law responses. When we've seen criminal justice responses, we've seen mass arrests. We've seen long detentions without trial. We've seen arrests of children. Um, and uh, we've seen the criminalization, marginalization um, of, a, of a lot of, uh, of specific groups of people, large groups of people, young people. Um, and, uh, and particularly res uh, repressive actions against these groups. Um, and then, of course, we've also seen counterterrorism rhetoric emerge in political debates and, and, the, and, and the suppression of political opposition. So some of those patterns um, have been very well documented by many of the people in this room, and, and we, we're aware of it. Um, our research um, in particularly Kenya and Somalia, uh, which we published in 2014, where we talked to Al-Shabaab fighters and fighters from the Mombasa Republican Council as well, actually reflect on some of these governance issues because many point to uh, the, 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 the turning point for them joining radical organizations and actually taking violent actions came from uh, a response to re repressive government action. Um, and, uh, and then other research that we've done, for example, in Nigeria, um, and uh, indicates the frustrations of young people, uh, especially young men, in having access to the economy and the issue of corruption also emerging very strongly. Them saying there's no way in, there's no way to progress. Um, and whether, how those fr frustrations play out in terms of taking violent actions, those pathways are not yet really understood. We don't understand them yet, but certainly those are some of the things young people are saying to us. Um, 
Other evidence, we've done a citizen surveys in uh, Nigeria, particularly in the affected regions in the north and then also in Lagos and, uh, and Abuja and talked to over a thousand respondents about um, government responses to Boko Haram. Now in the north people have been um, pleased that the government has taken some action. Uh, however, the impact of that action in terms of further displacements and people disappear, families being dissipated and so on, um, have raised questions about that. In the, the big cities, people are saying, we don't think the government can get, have control over this situation, but we actually, um, and we're not sure exactly what they should do about this. Uh, they're probably taking using the right responses by by these uh, forceful military actions. So, um, so there is a sense of not knowing what are the alternatives from citizens themselves, um, not knowing what to ask for from their governments in terms of the responses. Um, and uh, we've seen from our support work of uh, of law enforcement people, prosecutors, the judiciary. Uh, particularly in East Africa and the Horn, um, that, um, a, a, to some extent in West Africa as well, is that there is understanding amongst many of those practitioners about the strategies that they wish to take, which is in alignment with the global framework. However, they also experience a significant amount of political interference in what they do, in the, in w the choices they can make. And the policies may be there, but um, when the time comes to react, um, different orders are given which they need to follow. Um, so I do want to say there is some good news, and notwithstanding, for example, the challenges that um, Uganda faces, we know that we've seen them actively prosecute cases, we've seen them follow procedures, we've seen them deal with the most recent cases exceptionally well, not always successfully, but at least procedurally well. Um, and, and we think there's a, a lot to be um, um, uh, to be applauded in the law enforcement prosecutorial responses, the, the way the judiciary has behaved. Um, and, uh, and in East Africa and the Horn, certainly there's a general consensus amongst the law enforcement community, prosecutors, of how they should do things differently, how they would th do things differently. So we think there, is, um, there are very um, important things happening amongst certainly the uh, the institutions responsible. It's just whether we can expect the politicians to always behave the, the way they should. Um, so as a final comment then, um, is that I, I think this, um, you know, uh, last week's discussions with the UN, um, you know, really raised PVE as, uh, or CVE as the, as the sort of new thing that we need to be emphasizing. It's, it's being presented as somewhat of a panacea to, I think, the, the failures of, of, of uh, dealing with these problems. And, and there's a strong stated view that, you know, these solutions are to be found at a, at a very local level. So the point I would make is that I think we should be really very careful about CVE and PVE and we need to be thinking about it a lot, a lot more and I think I can say more about that in the, in the discussion. Um, but I think there is a lot um, more that we need to understand about the nuance in the programming we need to do uh, in order that it addresses these structural and institutional matters as well as matters at the local level. And, and it's, it's not just this clean equation of give people jobs and they won't, they won't be violent. And those sorts of um, assumptions that are somehow embedded in some of the PVE rhetoric at the moment are, I think are, are problematic. Um, so I will stop there and maybe we can pick up on some of these things later. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much to USIP and to Resolve for uh, uh, for, for inviting me. It's really a great honor to be part of this. It's been a great, uh, great discussion and great to be on this panel. Uh, I work for an organization called the International Crisis Group. Uh, we're a conflict prevention organization. Uh, we, uh, 
we're a global organization. We have experts in about 40 different countries. Uh, many of them are from the countries that they're working in. They're among the leading experts or leading political analysts, usually on the countries that they're working in. Uh, their research is very much the, the, the foundation of our work. They try to talk to as wide a range of people as possible. They talk to people in government. They talk to the opposition. They talk to armed groups. They talk to the communities that are vulnerable to, to, to violence. They talk to different parts of civil society. And we try to collect their findings in reports, policy notes, op-eds, and other pieces that we publish on our, on our website. Um, Crisis Group is, is, I think, best known for our analysis on individual countries or individual crises. Uh, but we have now started to move into cross-cutting or thematic research. And we published earlier this year a, uh, a report that looked at the rise of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, uh, its ability to spread elsewhere, and the, I think, what we called the resurgence of Al-Qaeda, uh, how Al-Qaeda was adapting to, to, to new conflicts in the Middle East, particularly in Syria, but also, of course, in, in Yemen. And the report really tried to draw on the, the, the deep expertise of, of our local analysts, of years of working on on these and similar movements uh, from West Africa all the way over to, to South Asia. And uh, we have uh, an enormous amount of work, follow-up work planned this year on, uh, in, in various different places that are, that are affected. Um, I was sort of reflecting on this question of governance uh, as, as the others were, were, were speaking. Uh, the link between governance and the emergence of groups like the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda, their ability to recruit, their ability to, to, to expand. You know, and of course, governance is an enormous part of the story. Uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Hafez's articulation of the legitimacy uh, problem in the Arab world was probably the most articula articulate uh, 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 or the best articulation of it that, uh, that I've heard for a long time. So, I mean, I, I completely agree with that. And, and clearly, from what the others have said, governance is an enormous part of the story. Bad governance, governance abuses, violence by governance, by governments, uh, uh, government illegitimacy, illegitimacy forms part of the narrative of uh, many violent extremist groups, many groups like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. So of course, it's an extraordinarily important part of the story. I think what struck me when the others were talking, though, is that it really the relationship between a government's relationship with its citizens, uh, its ability to provide basic public goods, its ability to include all of society, the relationship between that and other factors driving the emergence of these groups is really enormously context specific. And it really varies an enormous amount between different places, as I think the, these presentations showed very clearly. Uh, I think it emphasized to me something that's at the core of what Crisis Group does, which is understanding the local dynamics. But it was a re really re-emphasized this. Without a local understanding, it's very difficult to see, very difficult to understand how the relationship between bad governance and the emergence of groups like the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda plays out. And I think if we, to pick up on, on some of the things that Professor Hafez was saying, you know, of course, this, this problem of, of the crisis of legitimacy, that is the structural underpinnings of what's happened over the past few years in the Middle East. There's no doubt about that at all. Uh, that is the long-term problem. Um, and, and without addressing that long-term problem, the, 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 issue will, the issue of extremism will, will, will remain. That said, in the short term, that crisis of legitimacy didn't lead to extremism. Not in the short term, it led to protests. Protests in Syria, protests in Iraq, the toppling of governments in Yemen, the toppling of governments in Libya. And it was the genesis of those crises that have opened opportunities for Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. So the bad governments led to protests. Often regimes crushed those protests, as happened in Syria and Iraq. Or after those protests, after the toppling of governments, society struggled to find a formula for sharing power and resources, like happened in Yemen or in Libya. And it was the escalation of those crises that have opened opportunities for for both the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. So I think there the, the relationship with governance is, is profound, of course, but it's, it's, also, it's also indirect. I think you could go to, to Boko Haram, which, which we haven't talked about very much. Now, clearly, the, the Boko Haram, its emergence is rooted in the lack of governance in northern Nigeria. The presence of the state or the absence of the state or where the state is present, its reliance on local and often predatory forces. I think you can make a similar argument for other neglected peripheries whether in northern Mali or the Sinai or even the tribal areas in Pakistan, that the absence of the state, the absence of governance has been part of the problem. But it's always working in a combination with many other different factors. 
in northern Nigeria. It was the attempted uh, instrumentalization of Boko Haram by the governor. It was the brutal crackdown, very much uh, echoing what, uh, what Cheryl said, that the, the, the crackdown is often what really leads to, 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 the, to, to growing support for, for extremist movements. So in northern Nigeria, it was the instrumental, instrumentalization by the governor. It was the crackdown in Maiduguri. It was the extrajudicial killing of Mohammed Youssef, which really uh, pushed Boko Haram along the very destructive path that it, that it took. So it was a problem rooted in governance, matched with a certain set of circumstances which allowed the movement to then expand. And then I think if you look at the, the, the foreign fighters that are, that are traveling from many parts of the world to Iraq and Syria, the relationship between them and their state may be part of the story in some cases, but they're also being recruited online, they're being recruited through networks, and they're going for reasons that range from a search for identity, a search for purpose, fraternity, uh, adventure, a whole wide range of reasons of which their relationship with the state may be, may be one. So I think it is, a, while recognizing that governance is, of course, an enormous part of the story, uh, and, and the problem won't go away without improving relations between the state and society and state and its citizens in many places, it, it's not the whole part of the story, and the, the way it plays out varies between places. So it doesn't lend to general prescriptions, but of course the, it's not a problem that lends to generic prescriptions. We should be very cautious of generic prescriptions because of all the local specificities. Having said that, I will make one general prescription. Um, <laughs> And I think, it's, uh, you know, I think it is one that's, that's relevant and uh, particularly relevant today, and it is related to governance. And this is this sort of what comes next question. As uh, the Islamic State loses territory in Iraq and Syria, uh, around Syria in Libya, uh, as Boko Haram is pushed back from some of the areas that it controlled, as Al-Qaeda was pushed out of Al-Muqala in, uh, in Yemen. This question of what comes next, I think, is extremely important. And governance may not be the right, exactly the right word, but what comes next has to be better. Uh, this is partly about uh, the provision of basic public goods, certainly security, but also simple things like refuge collection and, and uh, sewage and water and schools and medical facilities, ideally some form of dispute resolution. Uh, it means that, it means basic services, but it also means that what comes next is, is inclusive enough uh, of all those parts, locally inclusive enough of all those parts of society, so that the conditions that led to the rise of these groups or the, the ability of these groups to take territory, the reasons that communities acquiesced or were forced to acquiesce aren't, uh, aren't replicated again. So I think this is, a, you know, for us, this is one of the big, um, big research questions this year. What will come next as these movements are starting to be pushed out of, of some of the areas they controlled? I think if you look back a year ago, there's no doubt that both the Islamic State and Boko Haram, for example, and to some degree Al-Qaeda and Yemen have lost territory. This question of what comes next, I think, is, uh, is an extremely important one. Great. All right, well, thank you. As, you, as I said, there's a, a lot of knowledge on this panel, and, and I luckily get the, the opportunity to ask the first question. Um, and I think you set me up well, Richard. Uh, one of the words that we've heard a lot uh, is context and complexity. Uh, and, and I think that's really important when we're talking about governance. Um, and, and I'm coming to someone who is a true believer in focusing on governance, uh, not as the panacea, but as something that is incredibly important and often, the, often overlooked. Uh, we spent the past year and a half trying to build a, a rapid assessment governance tool with partners at Creative Associates to actually get at this. Um, and what we found uh, is that uh, reality sometimes gets in the way. Um, there are political agendas, there are, there, are, there are actors, there are international interests, local interests and such. And so we can go in with the best of intentions and say, governance is important, let's build governance. Um, so what I'm really interested with this, this group is digging into where have you seen uh, international support uh, supporting the building of good governance uh, work uh, in your careers or in, in your research? Uh, and then how do we take that and extrapolate what's next? for uh, areas like Syria or Libya, uh, so we can hopefully do it better next time. Uh, why don't we start with the ambassador, uh, since you can actually talk about your experience within Bangladesh and the cycles that you've gone through, because uh, it's very context specific, and then open it up to the rest of the group uh, to talk about uh, broader regions or, or areas. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's a wonderful question. Uh, in Bangladesh, we are as we face the violent extremist threat, uh, the government and society both are trying to 
uh, address this challenge from their own perspective. From the government side, after this uh, July 1 uh, attack, the government uh, put in place, I would say, or rather sharpened their focus on policy areas and also certain some mobilization areas. For example, uh, zero, zero tolerance policy of the present government has been there for quite some time, but it was more in the realm of uh, policy. But now the government is trying to put it into effect. Now the challenge that is coming up is that when the government is trying to apply or becoming uh, uh, more tough on the extremist uh, elements, uh, that is creating again a law and order question. Extrajudicial killing comes into picture. Uh, too much of use of force comes into picture. Uh, so new questions are emerging as the government is trying to be tough on the extremists. Uh, that is one problem. And then uh, government on the other side is trying to mobilize the people against this scourge, for example. And a uh, lot of policies have been put in place uh, to mobilize different sections of people. And that's from the government side. And on the, on the social side also, we are those who are working at the civil society uh, groups or with the society as a whole or community as a whole. We are trying to now sensitize the people more intensely about the threat that is coming up. And particularly for the Bangladeshi case, and maybe, maybe this is relevant for other countries as well, uh, extremi violent extremism is a kind of uh, far end of the spectrum. The, the grievances comes first, and then perhaps frustration, alienation, humiliation, then radicalization, and then it goes into a violent extremism. So the, we have, we have, we, I think we have a huge space to work, uh, uh, particularly in this area. Uh, so we are looking at how we can help young people not to get radicalized. And that's, this is a space where we are trying. But on the grievances, we, can, we are trying to do whatever we can, but the issue, larger issues are beyond our control. For example, the issue of lack of justice, impunity, uh, uh, corruption. These are issues of government policy or government. They demand government intervention. And now, how the international community is engaging with us? Uh, government is trying to work with neighbors, for example. Uh, they, they are working, uh, taking support uh, from the Indian uh, government and Bangladesh and uh, India are both working together to, uh, to, to address this issue as much as they could. Uh, from the in, uh, other friendly countries, for example, the United States, the European Union, Australian government, those who are supporting the government to build up their capacity, they are working with the government. Now here, one, th one area where I think government has been slightly creative, I would say, is that they now re recognize that they can't do the whole thing or they can't uh, be active everywhere. So they have come to the realization that if somebody else could also help them to work both at, at the government side and also the community side, uh, that would be better. And in that space came recently the GSAR, Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund. This is a multi-donor, multi-partner fund that has come up recently. And it has uh, taken, uh, as pilot countries, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Mali, uh, Kosovo, uh, and perhaps one other country. So this is a, a kind of new framework uh, uh, for countering the violent extremism or radicalization even. And that's working with the government because the country support mechanism that is the central body in the, within the country is represented by the government, civil society, NGO, business community, and so on and so forth. So here we are seeing at the policy level, this is the GSAF has a country mechanism with blessings and support from the government side. But its activities are being done at the grassroots level, at the community level, to empower them, 
to build their capacity, build their resilience. And here, the civil society groups are working, uh, uh, working, I would say, uh, quite effectively. We have started the work, and we believe that if we can really improve the resilience of the society or the community, and then engage different stakeholders uh, into the community, then perhaps we can create an environment I'm not sure if we can stop all the attacks or we can uh, stop uh, all individuals from not coming here. But we can create an enabling environment where the possibility of the young generation or particularly young people getting radicalized and then going into extremist activities could perhaps be reduced. I think here, uh, this is, we talked uh, these days quite frequently and uh, Cheryl has mentioned the Secretary General's, UN Secretary General's plan of action, it talks about prevention. So I think it would be better if we uh, focus more on the prevention than on the, on the curative side. And GSAF basically is focusing on that prevention. And I believe that some, the societies such as uh, one in Bangladesh, uh, we have now enough space to work on the prevention side. And if we can do that, perhaps uh, the extremist state could be uh, dealt with quite effectively. And here, uh, the government's cooperation uh, with the civil society or community leaders will play a very important role. And from Bangladesh Enterprise Institute side, uh, I mean, we, are, uh, we do some research, uh, we uh, implement projects, do some advocacy with the government, and also give them policy support. Uh, for us, I think it would be a good opportunity to work and contribute uh, to this process of fighting uh, the violent extremism. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, now cut my own question short uh, in, in uh, the respect of time and open up questions to the audience. The rest of you, feel free to answer my question or answer the better questions from the audience. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, but I'll take three at a time. Uh, just because we don't have much time left, uh, and then we'll answer them as we, uh, as we see fit. So let's, uh, the young woman here in the black, uh, down in front, red tie, uh, and then uh, the, the woman right here in the uh, tan suit. Thank you, my name is Courtney Raj. Um, doing a report for the Center on International Media Assistance about the impact of CVE on media development. The media plays a critical role in good governance, and there are many studies and evidence that shows that media has an impact on reducing media transparency, helps reduce corruption, and that corruption is a driver of extremism. So I'm interested to hear what role you see for media, independent media, and good journalism in the type of approaches that you're suggesting. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Mary Greer. I work at the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative, and I particularly a uh, question for Cheryl, although any of uh, the other panelists are welcome to weigh in. In the, in the criminal justice area, I'm curious, you mentioned Nigeria and Uganda. Um, do you have any observations about why you think if there were criminal justice interventions, why they were more effective, whether there was more independence in the decision making, or you felt like the criminal justice actors were better trained? Um, and, uh, and one other part of that, was there any use of alternatives to incarceration in terms of an ultimate disposition rather than just continued detention? Um, Ivo Vinkamp, Hedaya, the International Center of Excellence for CVE. Uh, my question refers to the fact that, of course, uh, CVE, uh, violent extremism and radicalization is also a concern in Western countries. For instance, nowadays, obviously in Europe, but also in well established uh, non Western democracies like in Indonesia. So, my question to the panel is reflecting on the role of good governance and governance as such. Can you give your thoughts on how to look at this phenomena from the perspective of, let's say, a European democracy or even a non Western democracy? and also countries which have a relatively well-established uh, role for individuals and, 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 and communities to express their grievances and their opinions in a different way than using violence. 
Great, thank you. So we have media transparency in countering violent extremism, criminal justice, why some are effective and some are ineffective, and uh, now violent extremism in Western countries. Uh, how do we take a look at that and, and tackle that issue? So I will open it up to whoever wants to jump in first. Well, let's, let's have uh, someone who hasn't spoken. Um, maybe I can speak to the, the, the question on media first, is that um, we've worked with journalists in West Africa, particularly reporting on um, organized crime issues and corruption. And, um, and it's been a, a very difficult pathway to do that. Uh, because of the uh, the difficulties of the of the subject matter itself, but certainly um, the freedom of journalists to operate, the the media outlets available to them to use in order to communicate. However, um, it's been an incredible you know two years watching these journalists work and uh, producing stories that are in depth stories that inform the public. Um, and um, and that has been, I think, a real benefit. I think the real difficulty is the dangers that journalists face in the context of violent extremism um, um, in just doing what journalists do, is going out there and um, not only reporting on what's there, but also reporting on government responses to what violent extremists are doing and the crackdown on journalists from governments. Uh, just the um, and the lack of international support, I think, generally for journalists. Um, I think in some other forum, I heard discussions about, uh, you know, the protection of journalists being something that was very difficult to present in the Human Rights Council and um, getting representation of those issues. Um, so um, that's my comment on the journalists' uh, issues. It's really an important area for for investment but incredibly difficult. And a quick response to the criminal justice um, issue is that it, it also relates to Ca Cameron's original question about international assistance. Because I think that um, the successes, and I have to say they are minor successes, um, have been to do with uh, a discursive approach firstly with those governments and the governments who do want to engage. Uh, and, no, and not taking these formulaic approaches that international governments usually bring. And that is about, you know, just taking a tool or a set of tick boxes and saying this is what we need to achieve. Uh, and security sector reform across the last 20 years of, of tr making these efforts, we've seen the failures of massive investments uh, and very little returns on those investments. And I think it is because of the that international methodology. I think training is a, is, is a huge issue. It's what, a lot of what we do, but it does come with the discussion um, and then it does come with the need for the political support um, for whatever the bureaucracies um, should be doing and the political procedures for it. Um, for example, international assistance sometimes, um, and you know, we work at sometimes a very technical level, for example, bomb disposal and being able to investigate bomb incidents and in explosive incidents. Um, the ability to manage a crime scene, the ability to understand switches and detonating devices, the ability to understand the, the mechanics of these things takes training. Uh, you need specialized units to do this. And um, we find that international assistance can be really arbitrary in these. The Germans come in, or I'm not, I'm not, I'm using the Germans as, a, as an example, but I don't mean the Germans. <laughs> a, a, a country may come in and do a training, um, disappear for two years, another country comes in, maybe trains the same people, but not. Um, there's, there's so little coordination, there's so much disorganization. In fact, we started with some of the, the governments developing a database of who's being trained and so on, especially with something as technical as bombs, also and explosives, you do need ongoing training. Uh, and a lot of these terrorism incidents do need that sort of technical um, engagement in really investigators understanding what they're doing. You do need to train every year the same batch of people, uh, keep them in the same units and, and have all those negotiations with those governments about those things. So it's a mix of all of those three levels of things, in my view. Great. 
you know what, I'm going to hand it over if you have anything, because it's been the longest since you spoke. <laughs> Um, I guess I can just touch briefly on the last question around uh, violent extremism in, in parts of the non-developing world, so in, in the US and Europe. Although Mercy Corps, our research hasn't really focused on this, I think there can, you can draw parallels in terms of um, the communities that you see um, being engaged in violent extremist groups. In, for example, Europe, you have immigrant communities that have been largely marginalized um, and sort of excluded from the economic and political uh, process or, or um, life in those countries. So uh, again, I want to echo everyone by saying we, we're not trying to say that governance is the solution to, to all of the root causes of violent extremism. Um, but even in, in Europe and in America, I think there are ways in which government can, can focus on more inclusive processes to bring in communities that might be marginalized and then therefore be more susceptible to uh, the, the appeal of, of groups that sort of valued within their, within their countries. Um. I mean, I agree very much with, uh, with, with Beza. I mean, I think I, I would add maybe, and, and Ivo, you know this better than I do, and uh, I think Tarek also works on this, so there's others that, that know more about this than I do. But, uh, but I mean, in, in, in Europe, certainly, and, and I imagine here, recruitment patterns have changed enormously over the last 10 or 15 years. I mean, it's, it's, it's the Islamic State is not recruiting in the same way that Al-Qaeda used to recruit, and Al-Qaeda is not recruiting in the same way Al-Qaeda used to recruit. It's recruiting mostly in, in these parts of the world we're talking about. It's recruiting a lot of the time online, through networks, uh, and, and without the same sort of references or the very unsophisticated references to religion. I mean, certainly religion is used, but the references are often quite unsophisticated. Often the references are much more to youth, sub, the youth subculture, to belonging, to adventure, to search for identity. Uh, so I think the, 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 the patterns of recruitment have, have changed enormously, in some way pioneered by Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab started doing a lot of this some, some time ago. So I think those, those patterns have changed. So I think definitely the work within communities is extremely important. Um, uh, and trying to, 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 to disrupt the, the networks in particular, because it is done through, through, through networks. I would just like to pick up on something that, um, that Cheryl said earlier uh, about, um, about, about CV, um, because uh, you know, I think it's, 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 it is very important. And of course, there's, there's an enormous amount of, of enormous value in the CV agenda in a corrective to some of the counter-terrorism policies and the, and the very security-focused policies that sort of dominated the immediate response to 9-11. So the, the, the agenda holds enormous value, and it's, it, it, it's, 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 it's very well motivated. And uh, you can see that, it, that, that, that as a political tool to move governments the right way, it's extremely helpful. I think this is a discussion on governance and and violent extremism, you know, and I, I think there are some dangers into trying to subordinate goals related to good governance to counter radicalization. I think we should be quite cautious about labeling activities that are the basic obligations of states to their citizens, like providing education, building schools, uh, some of these other things that states should be doing in any case, bringing in excluding communities. I think we should be very cautious about labeling these CVE. And we can think of them, we can think of their benefits in terms of CVE, because they may have some in some cases. But we should be very cautious about labeling them CVE, particularly uh, in, in the areas where they're, where they're being conducted. There are clearly dangers in doing that in terms of stigmatizing communities, in terms of undermining the people who are actually doing the activities. And I think that's, that's, that's one thing that we should be quite cautious with the agenda. I think the other thing that we should be quite cautious, and again, it's, not, it's to recognize the enormous value in the agenda, but also recognize that there are some, some, some dangers in its implementation. I think the other danger is, of course, the, the, the definitional problem, and we're never going to resolve the definition of what is a violent extremist. Um, but but it, is, it is quite a fluffy uh, term, and I, I haven't found a definition yet that, uh, that I think is, is suitably narrow to not include a very diverse set of, 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 um, of, of armed groups or rebel, rebels or, 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 other, uh, or other social movements. Um, you know, and I think the, 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 the term is, is clearly very pejorative. Uh, I think there is uh, a danger that, um, that governments misuse the term and define their enemies or their political opponents as violent extremists in a way that 
that makes some of the policies that the CVE agenda promotes actually more difficult to, to, to promote. So I think that's another, that's another caution um, with, with, uh, with the agenda, that we should be, we should be careful about, very careful about, about labeling uh, both, both the labeling of the groups and the labeling of the, the, the activities uh, supposedly to counter them. Um, so we're running very low on time. Uh, so we're going to quickly ask two more questions. We'll have one minute answers up here, if that, uh, maybe 30 second answers. Uh, and then we can continue this conversation throughout the rest of the day. So let's take two very, very quick questions uh, here. And who else has a question? Yes, right here, the, the gentleman uh, in the suit. That's probably not descriptive enough. I apologize. <laughs> All right. Hi, Sorry, uh, hi. hi, my name is Zuhra Halimwan from GVU. Uh, the question is uh, to Richard, actually. You talked about the, what is next, what is after things were changed, and things are changing quickly. Um, since the extreme is becoming global, many fighters are foreigners who are serving now, if I can use the word, uh, in Syria. Now they have families and they have children who are growing up in the same environment. What would happen to those? What would happen, because most of the discussion we are talking about local and local initiatives, the governance and human rights of the locals and etc. But there is plenty of people who came from abroad, who been there, who have children now, and what would happen with the children of those who are actually involved in the extremism? Thank you. Thank you. Please. Yeah, I'm wearing my suit today. Um, I have a radical idea. I'm, I'm Peter Borson. Uh, I helped set up the European Institute of Peace, and I'm now with Rusi. Now, the radical idea is this, that I'd like you just to very quick feedback on. Um, if the main challenge, and you seem to agree with Professor Hafez, that the main challenge is ineffective governance, why don't we engage the, the violent extremists as our allies, not as our enemies? They seem to be addressing the same question. They are upset about ineffective governance. We are upset about ineffective governments. They do have traction, partly because they're brutal, but partly because they're onto something. Is, how far can we take this? Fantastic. All right. Each of you has 30 seconds to answer the issue around generational radicalization for foreign fighters and uh, to address this radical idea of uh, embracing our, uh, our uh, enemies. So 30 seconds. Solve it. Let's start with Beza, and we'll just go all the way down. Um, so I like the the idea of trying to question, um, you know, in a radical way, how do we actually address governance? And I guess just I think to make it short, the goal of, for for us at Multicore and for a lot of other organizations is to create other options for people to be able to change the situation in their countries besides violent options. So right now, ISIS and Al Qaeda and lots of other groups, Boko Haram, offer violence to people as a promise for them to be able to create these governance changes that they want. But I think our role and the role of the international community really is to create other alternatives, whether through diplomacy or through governance interventions at the local level, to basically be able to make those changes come about. Perfect. 30 Thank seconds. You. Yes, 30 seconds. Uh, interesting idea one could look at, and I think uh, some recent examples can testify to that. For example, in Nepal, from 96 to 2006, there was an insurgency uh, branded as extremist movement, and then eventually it was brought into the mainstream, and now the current prime minister himself is, a, is, is the leader of that movement at that time. Recently in Colombia, the FARC and the government uh, movement, uh, FARC and the government uh, have now agreed to a peace agreement. I mean, uh, as has been mentioned by Beza, alternatives can always be looked at. Now, if we are not too wedded to the brand, then perhaps uh, if we take a problem-solving approach, possibly one can look at that kind of outcome. Thank, Thank you. you. 30 seconds. Um, yeah, very quickly. I think um, also to respond to your question, um, I think the, the PVE framework is should actually be that if we are not to be conflating it and if we're trying to find out what it means 
rather than conflating it with all these development issues that should be separate. Um, and I, I think PVE allows for a lot of uh, thinking about that, especially at the local level where you are talking about communities um, who are dealing with these issues on the ground. So, um, and I'm not, I'm not sh certain about the sort of very international diplomatic level and how that works, nor at the national level, so I can't speak to that at all. But I certainly think that PVE offers us a, a, some way of defining it as its own thing if we do be, uh, if we are talking about issues such as the one you raised now um, at the local level. Thank you. Richard, concluding thoughts. 30 seconds. Uh, yeah. I mean, on the provocative question, I mean, clearly, it's uh, part of these groups' recent success is their ability to, in a very rudimentary way and, and with enormous variety, sort of provide basic public goods, security, and in particular, quick dispute resolution, which, uh, and again, it's very varied. I would say that, that overall, their, their track record is not great either. I mean, if, if there are very much reflects what Professor Hafez said at the beginning, that people are caught between two extremes. One is predatory predatory governments or illegitimate governments, and the other ones is, 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 is violent and, 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 uh, and extreme groups. Um, you know, I think the, the, the uh, you know, you could look across, and Boko Haram has done almost nothing in terms of governance. Uh, I'm sure the Taliban and the Shabab provide some sort of elementary dispute resolution, and, and certainly they're able to, to, to sort of resolve conflicts between communities in, in ways sometimes the government's unable to. But it's, if things were better, things have to be pretty bad before communities acquiesce or support them, I think. You know, I think really the big question, it's a question that flows very much from what Professor uh, Hafez said. You know, the, 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 if this is the structural problem, this problem of the, of the lack of legitimacy, you know, can, can regimes reform? And how are regimes going to reform over time? This is the big question, because they will have to reform. They will have to reform to meet the aspirations of, of growing youth populations, to meet the aspirations of their citizens. Uh, and I think the, you know, one of the big questions is, is can they reform in a way that, that doesn't lead to further instability? And can they reform in a way that, that sucks some of the oxygen from, from as you say, the, the other extreme? Thank you. Well, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the panelists for taking your time. We'll continue this conversation throughout the day. Uh, and, uh, and we'll solve all of this uh, within the next 12 hours. So thanks in advance. Candice Rondeau is going to come up and, and make a couple announcements, uh, and uh, we'll move from there. Can you hear me now? Good? Um, well, thank you all for coming again. Um, I'm Candice Rondeau. I am the uh, director of the Secretariat uh, for the Resolve Network here at USIP and a senior program officer. Um, we haven't done a lot of plugging of the network, so I feel like this is my one opportunity to do that uh, while we have a captive audience uh, at the moment. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about the network and what we're about, this is actually our first annual uh, fall forum. Um, we have uh, now 17 partner organizations, as many of whom you see here today. Our panelists are coming from all over the world. Um, and this is a, a tremendous effort to really um, build uh, relationships between organizations, between researchers, between practitioners and policymakers um, who are really concerned about the issue of violent extremism, whether we like the definition uh, of that term or not. Uh, we know it's very contested. Uh, but we know that there are some core problems, uh, as, as was said this morning uh, by, by Dr. Hafez. 
uh, and, and also our panelists just now on the governance panel. Uh, governance is a, is a root cause, uh, or poor governance is a root cause, and it is something that many of our um, guests here today uh, have encountered in the field. Uh, they do come from all over the world, um, and today um, we have a, a, a myriad of topics to talk about. This panel uh, is entitled um, A New Narrative. Um, we're going to explore the relationship um, between uh, religious identity and, and discourses on violence. Um, before I open it up to the panel, and I think we're going to try and keep it kind of Oprah style, that's the way I like to roll, um, <laughs> I, I want to encourage also our panelists um, to refrain from speeching, uh, giving long speeches. I think it's, it's important for us to sort of engage the audience too, because as I was noted, there are a lot of smart people uh, in the room today. Um, but before we get started a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about the topic and sort of, sort of set the tone a bit, um, because it's, um, it's something that you, know, you hear a lot about, the role of religious identity uh, in informing the way um, uh, communities think about violence um, and, and justice, most importantly. Um, a lot of ink has been spilled, a lot of money has been spent on countering, uh, uh, countering nar counter narrative campaigns. And, um, you know, I think we can say, uh, quite honestly today, I don't think we've gotten a lot of bang for our buck. Um, we see this, um, this effort uh, online, not only by the U.S. government, other governments too, uh, around the world, uh, have made an effort to kind of reach out via social media, uh, through, uh, you know, through videos, um, through uh, Twitter and so forth, uh, to try and reach this uh, group of uh, imaginary, sort of isolated folks out there. They're there. They are isolated. That is true. Um, but oftentimes, um, their journey uh, to, that, to that place, uh, whether it's on Facebook or on Twitter, um, is, is built by the community. And so I want to posit a few things. Um, I think our, our panelists would probably agree, but maybe have very different uh, views on maybe some of the nuances. That there, are, there are maybe three reasons uh, why uh, these types of campaigns, these counter-narrative campaigns, uh, have not been so successful so far. The first is, you know, when you're, when you're talking about um, violent extremism, we know that there's no single driver of violent extremism. There's no single narrative either. Uh, one thing that I think uh, Daesh has been very good at, Al-Qaeda has been very good at, they seem to intrinsically understand that identity is fluid uh, and that the motives uh, of individuals are, are fluctuate uh, varying uh, upon their context socially, uh, uh, politically, and economically. They understand how to tailor stories for women. Um, they know that stories about heroism, bravery, social justice um, are, are likely to appeal to young men. Um, and they can tell those stories in French, in Arabic, uh, in English, in Urdu. Um, and they can do it well, and they can package it in 30 minute, 30 second sound bites. Uh, something that I think uh, many governments struggle to do uh, is to work with sound bites. <laughs> Second, um, a lot of governments have been very unsophisticated in their approach. Uh, they've taken on this idea, for instance, uh, that religious figures, um, you know, provide potentially a pathway uh, to, to changing the mindset. Uh, around violent extremism, particularly uh, in Muslim-majority countries um, or particularly in, in places where the question of political Islam uh, is, is unresolved in the minds of, of some community members. Um, what they fail to sometimes, I think, understand is that actually many religious figures uh, have, have difficulty reaching those audiences um, because they're trained in, in classical, classical Arabic. Um, and so sometimes, you know, it's sort of like um, a kid will ask, you know, what do you think about the, the latest episode of Narcos on Netflix? Uh, and you have, you know, a priest saying, uh, well, let me tell you my son about Beowulf, right? So, I mean, there's a, <laughs> there's a kind of disconnect between the language um, that is spoken by a lot of religious figures. Uh, and I think a lot of our, our, our panelists here today will tell you uh, sort of what that means and, and why that's so important to sort of think about. Um, lastly, um, there, there is this obsession uh, within governments around um, trying to target messages through mobile phones, uh, through the internet. The reality is um, it's about relationships. It's about real family relationships, friends, peers, uh, those in your immediate network. Those are the people uh, who influence how you think. Uh, and they are the ones who maybe drive you to messages on the internet, but they're not the only ones. Um, 
So it's important to remember that in the Middle East, in Asia, in, in Africa, uh, a lot of uh, what's happening is happening at the kitchen table. It's happening in the market, it's happening in schools, it's happening in businesses. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for the sort of um, that level uh, of conversation and, and how to influence that. So I want to introduce our panelists very quickly. Uh, on my left here, uh, we have uh, Huda Abadi, uh, Dr. Huda Abadi from the Carter Center. Uh, she's the Associate Director of the Middle East and uh, Africa Conflict Resolution Program at the Carter Center. She's recently done a lot of work um, with religious figures in, in North Africa, um, trying to sort of um, uh, explore ways with them to, to reach out to communities um, and innovate in their messaging. Uh, Tahir Abbas is a senior research fellow with the Royal United Services Institute, otherwise known as RUSI, in London. Um, before joining RUSI uh, in 2016, very recently, uh, he lived and worked in Istanbul for six years. Uh, he has a tremendous amount of experience researching and writing on ethnic relations, Islamophobia and radicalization uh, since the 1990s. Uh, Imtiaz Ghul, an old friend from days in Pakistan, um, is the CEO of the Center for Research and Security Studies. He's an author of four books on Afghanistan, militancy in Pakistan, and radicalization. He's, leading a, he's also a leading national analyst on security. You can see him often uh, on, on Geo News and others uh, in Pakistan. He's a very popular figure there. My colleague, uh, Eliza Irwin, is a senior program officer here at USIP. Uh, she is in the forward office of, uh, for, for our operations in Kabul. Uh, and she oversees peace, peace building and CVE projects there. Welcome to all of you. Let me just start quickly with a question um, that I hope will prompt a discussion between yourselves. Um, why is it um, so difficult to, to reach um, young people or women uh, in communities uh, that are impacted by violent extremism? What are the pathways um, that um, are the most effective that you've seen in the field? Thank you, first of all, good morning. Thank you for having me, it's an honor to be here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about just set the background on what we do so I can share some of the lessons learned from our own project. So I lead a project on countering Daesh propaganda by working with religious and community leaders. Um, the first component of the project is really research, which fits really nicely into the narratives. We have um, coded more than uh, 200, 300 videos of Daesh's propaganda. We've looked at all of their online magazine, Tabiq, and now the French one that has come up, which kind of, it's a kind of, um, helps us with working with religious and community leaders. We are working with religious and community leaders from Morocco, Tunisia, France, and Belgium. And so one of the things that I would like to start to say is, Daesh has really capitalized on failed states, core socio-political grievances, misinterpretations of religious texts, and a an yearning for an idealistic Islamic society. Uh, but if we look at Daesh's narratives, we've identified seven main narratives that really depend on the context of the recruitment. So I will just very quickly outline them. So one is humiliating the West. Second is Western transgression of the Muslim Ummah or of the Muslim world. The third one is military jihad. Fourth is providing social services. So you see them like being basically that if you join Daesh's territory, you'll become a full citizen. You're, able, you're gonna be able to be an engineer or a doctor. Your dreams will be coming true. You're gonna have uh, education um, and you're gonna be given basic rights that you were not given in your own uh, host country. The, fourth, the fifth one is hypocrisy of the Muslim Mina and uh, religious leaders. Uh, the sixth one is the ability to administer territory, um, territory and provide law and order, so the question of justice. And the last one is pure theological and, uh, pure the theological and religious appeals. I would like to say that the pure religious appeals, so the reason why Daesh in their propaganda, that the reason why you need to join Daesh's territory is to become a better Muslim, is less than 10% of their propaganda. So I, I just want to I, I want to showcase that it's not really it's not really the religion that is the main problem. They are it's cloaked in a religious rhetoric, but it's more that it moves beyond the uh, uh, religion in of itself. It's more core socio political grievances. And then moving a step ahead, one of the problems that we have not been able to uh, 
to really be very effective is, I would say, one, the most important thing is one, we have not tackled the rise of Islamophobia, and this goes hand in hand. If you're trying to tackle uh, Daesh extremism, you need to tackle also the rise of the radical right because they feed e each other. It's the same, it's you know, two faces of the same coin. So if you're trying to do one, you need to do the second. There's a lot of lack of trust by religious and community leaders. The second one is also the notion of the good versus the bad Muslim. So we're gonna engage only with the moderate, quote unquote, moderate religious leaders, and we're not gonna engage with the conservatives. The fact that we also use in our uh, terminology moderate Muslims is in of itself problematic. So we need to move away from good versus bad Muslim because we feed into Daesh's ideology. This is exactly what they want, and us versus them. And really also engage with very much conservative Salafi religious leaders. They, Salafi religious leaders or conservative Muslim leaders does not equate terrorists, does not equate um, you know, violence, political violence, and we need to move away from this. Um, in just uh, this month, early this month, we had a workshop with religious leaders, and it was mixed between mainstream religious leaders and Salafi religious uh, leaders and ex-foreign fighters, including women, because women are really the community gatekeepers. They know what is happening. It's still an untapped resource. And the workshop was amazing. I mean, these people would not have been together. Um, I myself had my own preconceived stereotypes that, oh my goodness, one of them is just gonna walk out. But the fact that everyone has their own following and has their own ideology is in enriched uh, the discussion in of itself. And lastly, I want to say that one of the problems with religious and community leaders is the fact that many of them rely, as you mentioned, on very traditional forms of communication. So if you Google Muslim responses on Daesh, you would see tons and tons of, really, it will take you days to uh, go over every single Muslim response against Daesh. However, the problem relies on, they've relied on traditional forms of uh, uh, language, so a lot of times it's classical Arabic. When you look at Daesh, not only they have, uh, you know, like Spanish, English, and various languages, but they also have dialects of that particular country. And as I said, they're very, very much hyper-local, and our responses haven't been hyper-local. They're also very static, religious leaders, uh, have been in their response has been more traditional. You can see even if they take it to the online, a lot of times it's the khutbah where it's the preacher who's giving a khutbah and it's very static. So they, the youth are not able to engage very much with the religious leaders. There's kind of a disconnect between youth and religious leaders. When you look at um, Daesh, again, it offers, it provides an alternative. It says to youth, if you're angry about these socio-political grievances, there's something you can do. So we also need to provide an alternative uh, to these socio-political grievances that you can do something. Um, there's also uh, a problem with um, safe space for women. Can we provide safe spaces for women? It could be in mosques, but it also could be empowering young women in the Muslim communities. Uh, so they have also a voice. If you see Daesh, you can see a lot of young women, even from Europe, going into Daesh and, think, and feeling that they're gonna be empowered. And some of the questions like, well, how are these young women from the UK or from France deciding to leave to Daesh? But they provide them an alternative and we need to think the same way. So let's, let's pick up on that a little bit to hear, uh, you know, this, this question of empowerment um, in, in settings where disempowerment is generally the rule, whether you're living in Belgium and you find yourself uh, as an outsider because of your uh, religious or ethnic identity, or whether you're, you know, in Egypt uh, and you have no way in uh, because you don't have a vote um, or, you, you know, you, you're not able to politically participate. Um, what about the empowerment piece? Well, um, thank you for that. Thank you uh, to conference organizers uh, for the opportunity and, uh, and welcome to everybody here. I mean, the empowerment question is obviously uh, an important one in the sense that we are dealing with young people who have uh, a series of grievances which are not being dealt with. There isn't a response on the part of the state to provide the opportunities and mechanisms for integration and participation. So they feel excluded, marginalized, left out. Their voices are not heard heard by, by uh, those within their own communities, nor the political elites uh, at the center. 
So this is an ongoing phenomenon. We've seen this uh, time and time again, and we're not uh, recognizing this for what it is, because the fact that we've got at least, uh, in the case of, say, um, British-born young men who join various uh, overseas campaigns, we've had this happen since the 1980s onwards. And, and so what we've got is an ongoing situation of division, exclusion, uh, polarization, deep politicization, and uh, we're not recognizing or accepting that uh, young people are experiencing tremendous uh, democratic deficits. They're experiencing severe exclusion and marginalization on top of racism and discrimination and Islamophobia, which are wider societal factors. And unless we begin to understand and appreciate and also do something about these issues. We're going to get more and more of the same problems. We understand that grievances are a, are a driver, but we don't do anything to address those grievances. Imtiaz, I mean, I, I know you've had very different experiences. I think the experience in, in South Asia, and I think Eliza probably could speak to this as well, um, th there's a different set of motivations. I think, you know, Daesh um, is, is not as big a player in, in the way uh, that you have in the Middle East. Uh, they certainly are able to, to harness and capture messages, um, but there are other concerns there um, that I, I think you, you've seen in your work. Tell us about that. Yeah. First, thank you very much, and uh, uh, good afternoon or good morning still. Um, you know, we have, have been through various phases of uh, facing uh, religiously inspired fighters, it all began in 1979 with the anti-Soviet jihad and then the emergence of the Taliban. And with that, the narrative has kept changing. So the narrative basically uh, changed and it also diluted the social fabric of the society in Pakistan, in which you saw the erosion of constitutional values, the fundamental rights in Pakistan which, and increasingly the prism that people applied to viewing the world, viewing the others, uh, was religious, more religious than, um, than constitutional values itself. So this is the context that uh, basically prompted us to start um, a Center of Excellence counter radicalization program uh, at the Center, of, uh, Center for Research and Security Studies a, a year ago. And that is basically anchored in fundamental rights. Rights, issues like uh, the rule of law, equal citizenry, uh, and diversity, respect for diversity. Uh, and the issue that we are discussing right now about the religious identity, that religious identity uh, issue in Pakistan, for instance, reduces the non-Muslims into second or third grade citizens. You know, we have like maybe hardly three, three and a half percent of non-Muslims. Uh, predominantly is the Sunni Muslim state. But according to the constitution, only a Muslim can become the president or the prime minister. So thereby, I think the state, uh, the state document itself uh, distinguishes between its citizens and it itself then flouts the very basic Article 25 about the equal citizenry. So there's a massive contradiction. And when we, in our programs, try to highlight this uh, contradiction, uh, we have often also confronted a lot of opposition, uh, questioning, uh, at times also problems, despite the fact that the, the program that we are conducting is an engagement with university teachers. Now imagine, they're all, most of them are masters, some of them are PhDs. Uh, but when you bring in this issue, they're always then, uh, they're unruffled, this discomfort among certain people. Like uh, four days ago, the trainees were taken in Islamabad to a Hindu temple. And when they came out, some of the teachers said, oh, we must now recite some verses from the Quran to cleanse ourselves. You know, that Hindu temple or a church is seen as something that has polluted them, their, their belief. And imagine these are university teachers, agents of change. So 
the religious identity issue, particularly for the minorities in Pakistan, has uh, become serious in that, in that respect. But the larger issue is, of course, this deviation from constitutionalism, mm. that increasingly the prism that people apply is Islam and not the constitution, not the global universally practiced and acknowledged values of rule of law, equal citizenry. And that, I think, then also facilitates the extremist narrative, whether it's coming from Daesh or whether it came from Al-Qaeda, because they prey on young, vulnerable people within the community to, to explain to them, to convey to them that you are being, being wronged by the state, a state which is colluding with external forces you know, the sense that you were talking about, this sense of humiliation, sense of victimhood uh, of the Muslims by the West, by this colluding West. Uh, and then military interventions, of course, you know, what has happened in Libya, in Syria, uh, in Afghanistan. So this then very strongly impacts it, it, their view on the world, the Weltanschauung, and, you know, the worldview that the Germans call it. And I think that is a big complication in countering uh, violent extremism. And another issue is that uh, unless we diagnose the problem correctly, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's just the violent extremism religiously inspired or whether it's politically inspired in, in many instances across the world, it will be very difficult uh, to, to get the right recipe. Um, and I think, uh, quality research, the way you, know, you intend to uh, promote, encourage, uh, probably can help us uh, find better recipes for uh, countering uh, extremist uh, violence or violent groups, regardless whether they're religious or uh, political. Actually, I'm reminded of, uh, if you give me another two minutes, uh, of a recent article, uh, a recent paper by an Indian a Kashmiri journalist um, which he read at a, at a conference. Uh, if you allow me, I'll just read, read it out uh, from that, a, a brief ex excerpt. Uh, and this basically, uh, why I'm forced to reproduce this or re read it in front of you, because he was resonating what I said at a conference in Kandy, Sri Lanka in March. It has nothing to do with the ongoing insurgency or violence in Kashmir, but I just stumbled upon it in my, uh, while researching and I had said so more or less the same thing to my Kashmiri friends who were agitating that Pakistan, for instance, is not doing enough, that you know, we need to go back to the religion, you know, that the Kashmiri fighters you know, should be supported, whereas a lot of it carries a religious color. So I cautioned them that don't do this. And this journalist, Tofail Ahmed, uh, says, says that, uh, and he wrote basically, an, uh, the paper was titled, We're Losing Kashmir to Islam, 10 ways to counter radicalization in India. And this was recent, actually, a couple of months ago. He says, bear in mind, in the age of the internet, nations will be invaded by ideas. TV debates about pallet guns, reference to the ongoing violence in Kashmir, are more powerful than bullets. Fatwas by clerics, mullahs, are more consequential than the Supreme Court orders. As we see in Kashmir, jihad could be more dangerous uh, uh, for militaries, and we are losing Kashmir to Islam. Jihadism, he says, you know, is, did not originate among the masses, but it originated among the educated elite. It, this is an idea that was coined and sowed by people who mattered. So this is what he is cautioning against: that don't use religion in your f fights, in your political fights. And I think this is a big danger. So that's why it's very important, actually, to keep the religion separate from, the, uh, from politics and also to find recipes, but not in isolation of the political, geopolitical factors that constitute a very uh, important pillar of the extremist narrative. Thank you. you picked up on some very um, important themes there, and I think Eliza's probably got a lot to say about that. I mean, just in terms of this, uh, this question in the, in the narrative, uh, many narratives, which is very multifaceted, but one theme keeps coming up. It's this idea of 
um, purity and profligacy and citizenship and righteousness and legitimacy, um, which is something that you know you could talk about it in a in a, in a briefing paper for ICG or for uh, CRSS. Um, it, it sounds quite abstract, but I think you know there are some environments, like at the university level um, or in schools and school settings, um, particularly in Afghanistan, where you have this extreme divide um, between um, those who kind of have a secular view um, and, and those who do not. Uh, and this is the tug of war at the very local level. Yeah, thank you, Candice, and uh, and thank you also. I will I will echo the other panels to the Resolve Network and to USIP. Although, uh, as an employee, that may seem oddly self-serving. Um, <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of one of the really interesting things about working with narratives in the context of Afghanistan is understanding how unbelievably contextualized they are, not just province to province or region to region, but village to village. And it's something that violent extremist groups are extremely adept at exploiting. And one of the more fascinating findings through our work has been that the Taliban actually conduct essentially baseline assessments. They go into villages and areas and they understand exactly what, they, what the very localized grievances are and play to some of these, these issues that Candace was speaking to to create narratives that will, um, that will exploit uh, local grievances as well as community identities. And identity is an incredibly important community, um, tool for community organization and even survival in Afghanistan. Um, and for the most part, really, and this is not a phenomenon that's unique to Afghanistan, but religion is used by, by these interest groups and, and uh, especially by violent extremist groups in order to further their political objectives. And so I wanted to speak to um, you know, one of the, the first questions, or the second question you asked, which is one of, one of the sort of pathways that works. Um, groups, and, and particularly populations and demographics that are living in more rural or isolated locations, um, may never sort of interact with one another, making them particularly vulnerable to narratives of othering and sort of general distrust. And in light of this, and, and within the scope of, of our CVE work, USIP has designed uh, a number of projects to try and bridge divides between these groups and to develop s stronger social cohesion, uh, intergroup tolerance, and intergroup trust. And so I'd like to speak uh, very briefly about one of these projects that we piloted uh, beginning last year and that, that is ongoing right now, um, which was a project that sought to bring together two disparate groups, students, youth, teenagers from madrasas and from public high schools in two provinces of Logar and Wardak. These students had at best very little to no interaction with one another and at worst they had already well developed and narrow stereotypes of the other. And in our sort of baseline evaluations ourselves when we spoke to these students about what their perceptions were of the other group, we heard um, like I said, at best neutrality, and at worst, uh, some fairly sort of extreme narratives with uh, madrasa students referring to public school students as infidels corrupted by Western morality, and public school students uh, using language such as suicide bombers in training to refer to their madrasa counterparts. And this kind of aggressive stereotyping obviously results in deep divisions with these communities, which are then exploited in a number of ways by, by violent extremist groups. And so one of the things that we sought to do was to bring these two groups together um, through regular, structured, and, and long-term interaction with one another. And the way that we chose to do that was through a common learning objective, and specifically it was journalism classes. And the journalism classes focused on print journalism and documentary filmmaking. And we focused or chose that particular subject really for three reasons. On the one hand, it was uh, a subject where neither group had any sort of comparative advantage, so both groups came together essentially as equals. Um, it was a sort of benign or non-sensitive platform, which meant that it wouldn't necessarily incur objections from the community or from either participant group. Um, and also, we kind of hoped that some of the products or outputs that the students would end up making together would potentially serve as their own counter-narrative. But the primary objective was really to break down some of these, some of these detrimental stereotypes through the, the weekly trainings and joint work. And so the physical output was really sort of of secondary importance. The pilot lasted six months. 
and on a weekly basis, the students were brought together. High school students were paired with madrasa students. They were given certain skills in, in print journalism and documentary filmmaking, and then they went out into the community to gather stories. So I'll just touch on um, a couple of really quick uh, sort of findings from that before I conclude. Uh, one of the more interesting things that we discovered, of course, we did sort of baseline, midline, and endline, and this uh, almost refers to one of the questions asked earlier about the potential role of journalism. The nature of the training itself ended up providing an opportunity for us to gauge shifts in both attitude and behavior. Watching the students interact with each other, we could, we could measure the shifts in behavior in terms of the way that the students related to one another. And in terms of shifts in attitude, um, we were able to essentially look at the content of their writing. So just to give a really brief example, at the outset, Wardak and Logar, there's, uh, there's it been intractable conflict for, for decades through a number of different reasons. Um, but notably, one of the things ongoing there is violent extremist violence and especially suicide bombing targeting government officials. And at the outset, the students from both madrasas as well as high schools would, would um, use a very specific set of language to describe these. They would say fidai bombings, which meant um, instead of suicide bombing, which implies sort of religious devotion and, and the justification of, of the act. They would refer to the suicide bombers as martyrs or shaheed. Um, and the government forces that died as murdar, or, or sort of soiled souls. And I apologize to any Afghans in the audience whose language I just butchered. And the context of journalism allowed the trainers to highlight um, the issue of neutrality in language, and allowed them to sort of deconstruct and think about sort of fact versus opinion. They pushed them to interview other people to bring in outside opinions, um, rather than interjecting their, their own opinions into the language of the piece. Um, and one of the things that we noticed over time was that these same issues were then sort of mirrored in the way that these youth described events in their own lives or described other stories outside of the context of these journalism pieces. The second uh, was a sort of diminishing in other forms of intergroup prejudice. So in a second iteration of this project, we included, there was about 200 students in the, in the pilot. In the second iteration, we had the same number, and we managed to get about 17 girls into the program. And that was met outwardly immediately with hostility, especially from the madrasa students who often had never interacted with, uh, with the other gender before. And little by little, we were able to diminish that intergroup hostility, not just between madrasa and maktab students, between genders, between the rural and urban divide, which we had under, uh, underestimated the importance of. Um, and so I think, yeah, my, uh, my, my final takeaways from this were, first of all, that you know, not only are identities not uh, incredibly fluid, but they are incredibly localized. They are not remotely monolithic. Um, and uh, I think the other thing I'd like to impart is the sort of interesting notion of journalism as a tool to, to sort of counter this, notably because it impresses the importance of critical thinking, of fact-finding, of verification and triangulation of information, what is a primary source, so on and so forth, um, but also um, for, for focusing on neutrality and sort of the deconstruction of language, and then very importantly for marginalized youth for giving the voiceless a voice. Thank you, Liza. You know, you, uh, a couple of things you said there that um, jumped out at me, and I was thinking about something, uh, Imtiaz, that, that we talked about a little bit, um, about the role of Tablighi um, uh, uh, clerics and, and kind of their, their influence uh, today in, in Pakistan. Uh, I think you can say the same. There are some in, in Afghanistan and elsewhere as well. Um, I just wonder, though, going back to your point about um, how bound up the idea of citizenship is with apostasy um, and this sort of this tension between the two and disbelief, um, can, can you scale up um, an experiment like uh, the Maktab Madrasa program, uh, as USIP has done in Afghanistan, uh, and, and hope that that would be enough to push back against um, a, a rather statist question around, um, around citizenship. Uh, do you, must, must you be a Muslim, uh, truly, uh, to, to participate in political culture uh, in, in these countries? If so, what is a real Muslim? Um, and who controls that, that narrative? As a 
very divisive debate, um, but I personally have uh, come to the conclusion that unless we reconnect uh, the citizenry with the Constitution, unless uh, the ruling elites prioritize the issue of the rule of law, indiscriminate rule of law as a top priority, it will be very difficult to bridge this, uh, this cleavage between the Muslims and the non-Muslims. Uh, we have been okay, I think, until uh, this war on terror uh, began unfolding and these extremist narratives usually, uh, uh, gradually took over because out of the womb of uh, this war on terror was born this Daesh and also local uh, extremist groups uh, who have also basically in the garb of religious ideology, they are basically perpetrating uh, um, terrorism, terrorism as part of um, the proxy war between the two or three countries within the region, Afghanistan, Pakistan and India. So that's why it's extremely important, number one, to, for the ruling elites to go back to the constitution. Number two, the extremist, uh, the, the diagnosis has to be correct. Are we talking of professional hired assassins who are disguised as Daesh or TTP or Al-Qaeda? Or are they really, really religiously inspired fighters? So, in, and therein comes the role of the Tablighis, the preachers, that they appear to be very pacifists, peaceful preachers of Islam. But if you look at the narrative that they peddle all, all along, it's hardly different from what Hezbollah Tahrir talks about. It's hardly different from what Daesh talks about, this anti-Westernism, this uh, conspiracy of the US, Israel, India nexus against the Muslims for instance. This is common to them all. And this they use as oxygen, as adrenaline practically for most of the people. And people unwittingly also walk into this trap. They embrace this ideology as something sacrosanct. And this has a huge pull factor. As I told you, one of our very famous TV anchors recently has gone a little the other way. A very liberal socializing lady has just returned from Hajj. Hajj in the company of the country's top preacher who has galvanized tens of thousands if not millions of people just because this, because of the absence of critical thinking. It's not enough critical thinking because our curricula doesn't uh, provide, for, provide th this for and also the ruling elites, you know, wouldn't like the people to think critically. And then the space for critical thinking has also shrunk. Uh, that they're not, they are the people who object to our way of life, maybe small in numbers, but the nuisance value is big because they are brainwashed, politicized, and um, they're just wedded to their cause. So they can do anything, they can take any life, any time if they think that this guy or girl is opposed to our way of life. It's like apostasy, you know, the, the issue of apostasy. So this way your life becomes vulnerable there. That's why it's very important for this thing to come from the top. The, uh, I was a little uh, quite um, encouraged last year when the prime minister, some opposition leaders started talking about the equal citizenry for the first time in so many years, uh, Amir, I think, can vouch for that, that on the floor of the parliament, one opposition leader picked up the Article 25 that is so close to my heart. It's about equal citizenry. The prime minister eventually went to a Hindu temple. You know, so we have these other examples as well. And this probably can set in motion uh, a new dynamic. So for that, the ruling elites need a little more uh, proactive approach, courage, uh, and I think we can overcome this. But I suspect you're going to want to push back a little bit based on your experiences um, with Salafists. Um, at, at, at sometimes, I think there's sort of a conflation, as you've noted, uh, with the Salafist kind of um, theological framework, uh, which has actually three or four different levels. Right? You have the quietists, 
um, who are uh, a, a bit more passive uh, in, in, their, in their goals and their, uh, in their stretch for um, engaging uh, with the state. Um, and then you have other, you know, um, perhaps more extreme uh, or more violent variations. Um, but I mean, I think that there's something, there's something in between here that we're missing. And that what are we missing in the conversation with, with Salafists or, or others? Um, and, and I think also important to make a distinction between Salafism, uh, Tablighism, uh, you know, and, uh, and Wahhabism, because there are differences, there are distinctions uh, that I think we, that are also important to note. Um, thank you for this question. Um, so, absolutely. I think one of the issues I am going to a little bit push back because there's also different schools of thought even within the Salafism. And so, for example, when we were trying to think of organizing a workshop and we were going to have a separate workshop for mainstream religious leaders and then a separate one for Salafi conservative religious leaders, we realized this is problematic and we heard from them that the competition within, it's not between mainstream and Salafi, but it's between Salafi and Salafi because of the different schools of thought within Salafism as well. But Salafism does not mean militancy at all. I mean, Salafi means like returning back to the Prophet, like the way they did things. So they might be conservative, we might not agree with their ideologies, but that doesn't mean that this is going to lead to political violence. I would say the worst enemy for Daesh is citizenship. That's the worst enemy. I mean, so if we're trying to fight Daesh to counter that, other than counter narratives and online and offline media strategies, if you really look at the propaganda of Daesh, you would see that what they are giving uh, to the followers, we have youth coming from a hundred different countries. We focus so much on the Muslim countries, the MENA region, but their youth have been coming from Europe, from North America, from Latin America. Why? Why are there these youth coming from all over? And that's an important question we need to ask. And so the, the, the inclusion, the political participation, you see in many of the, I mean, many of the Salafi religious leaders that were involved in our workshop are participating uh, in, the, in the incoming elections in some of the countries where they're from. So the fact that they feel that there's political participation, they have a huge following and they feel that their voices are heard is very important. And then when we look back and say, well, if, uh, you know, if citizenship is the worst enemy for Daesh, because that's what they say, like if you are a Muslim and you believe, for example, I'm a Muslim and I identify myself as an American and I identify myself as a Moroccan, it's a completely like I am a very bad Muslim. I can be killed. So if that's the worst enemy, but if you look at them and reverse the coin and say, well, then what can we do to ensure if what they are providing, the services that they're providing, uh, the fact that they can uh, bring justice. So we need to reframe in terms of our fight against Daesh and say, how can we, how can we strengthen? Uh, how can we make sure that our citizens feel that they are included in the political process, that they are not marginalized? Why are these youth leaving? Um, and how can we make sure that we hear from everyone and try to respond. And that's also the role of the government. And so it's not just in terms of counter narratives. And I think this is where we have it wrong. There has been a huge focus. But a lot of these followers, for example, they would see, uh, youth would see uh, counter messaging from various governments and they know it's coming from the government. They will not believe it because they, they already see it as being illegitimate. They already see it as they are, you know, victimized and humiliated by this government. And so to kind of think, well, what are the roles of the government and what are the, the role of the religious and community leaders and really be able to apply resources effectively. Here, I'm going to ask you, um, and I'm conscious of the fact that we have uh, probably some questions in, in the audience, but uh, picking up on this, this idea that citizenship um, might be the panacea that we're looking for, it may not be the, uh, the, the entire panacea, but it will go a significant way to, to try and uh, help with the situation. I mean, if we think about uh, the idea of active engagement and participation in society, if that's been removed, then people's basic sense of their belonging to the state or to society is completely removed. If we can provide those uh, opportunities, it counters directly the narratives of Daesh. They feed on this. We feed into their 
into their narratives. And this relates to the point uh, earlier that uh, was made by Inthe as about diversity. We don't celebrate diversity in the way that we might have done until, until very recent periods. In fact, multiculturalism has become a dirty word. As much as PVE and CVE tends to get criticism within the academy, uh, there is uh, a sense that multiculturalism has failed. But who failed multiculturalism? Did, did, did we, as a community of uh, communities, not galvanize with each other? Or was there not a, a sense of ownership of the, the concept by the state in, in, in making it a, a generalizable norm across society as a whole? So I think this citizenship question is also very relevant in terms of the idea of being able to participate and engage in society, to build that trust and that engagement. So it becomes the case that it's perfectly possible to be a good Muslim and a good Briton. And there is no conflict of interest between these two ideals. And uh, when the state starts to divide between good Muslim or bad Muslim or good Salafi or bad Salafi, then we end up uh, in, again, polarizations and politicizations. Thank you. We're going to open up to the floor. There may be some questions here, quite a few. Um, I'll take this lady in green here. Um, I, I have to take <laughs> Mohammed Amir. Um, and then maybe we'll take one more if there is one more. Uh, perhaps the gentleman next to the, the lady in green in the back. Um, hi, I'll try to make the question very really short. I've been involved in developing narratives in Pakistan, and I sometimes feel that perhaps those of us who are developing narratives lack legitimacy, political, social legitimacy, legitimacy ourselves. And that is perhaps why we don't see the impact. Um, here uh, at the panel, people talked about uh, constitutionalism, and I agree with Impias up there. But I also feel that um, just looking at, at, at where and who are producing the narratives, I feel that there's an elite consensus um, and which is completely divorced from local society. That is why the TTP and Al-Qaeda and Daesh, they have their ears to the ground. Um, perhaps we don't. Uh, Ahmed Ali, actually I have a question for Dr. Hoda uh, about countering uh, ISIS. Um, there, is, there are many uh, empirical uh, evidence about how uh, uh, ISIS interpretation for Islam is t totally different to the tradition because there is a lot of impact of modernity. Uh, I'm not talking here about Twitter or Facebook, I'm talking about the impact of modernity on uh, modern jihad, like how they have individual interpretation for Islam and this is Again, it's the tradition way to interpret it, Quran and Sunnah, and how how you can use like some sheikhs or Salafi even leaders to counter the ISIS narrative, and they don't have the base lines. You have different base line because they have those people they are following the tradition, and the ISIS they have individual interpretation for, and they have their own interpretation for Islam. Down here we have uh, one more question, I think. Uh, uh, thank you, Abadi, bringing this uh, citizenship question in the debate, which was missing even the last session. I think this is quite important, that whether this is the, the governance or other factor contribute exposing the society to, to extremism. I think ultimately their objective and criticism, they basically attack on the constitutions, social contracts, and the concepts of the citizenships. Uh, this is happening, what's happening in the Muslim societies. But this is, I think, the issue which is creating the lot of debate, whether we have to be fix the governance issues first, or to be address this, uh, or to review the social contracts in Muslim society. What is your experience, whether you had work in the field, this Salafi and this uh, uh, humbly scholar willing to review the social contract if they have certain ideas. So what kind of the, the review or the changes, amendment they want in these, the social contracts? All excellent questions. I'm going to try and sort of blend them together because I think I heard a lot of common themes. Um, the, 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 most importantly around uh, this question, I think Marshall McLuhan said it best, the medium is the message, um, but if the, if the medium is not viewed as credible, if the storytellers are not credible, 
Um, you know, how do we handle that problem? How do we regain credibility for storytellers? Who are the storytellers who need to be engaged? Um, and then the second question is really around uh, in what language, um, you know, that, that will legitimately convince people, um, you know, beyond sort of quoting from the, the sunnahs and the hadiths, uh, that actually the social contract um, is something that we all can engage in, whether we're Muslim or not. Let me try to respond to all three together very quickly. Hopefully I make sense. Um, so on the question of the narratives, I think the who is doing the counter narratives, who is providing an alternative, but, but also like providing an alternative and providing also an avenue is very important and is key. And a lot of times we need to go back to the local grassroots people. We forget them. We have our uh, favorite imam, our favorite sheikh that we bring to all of the conferences, and they're famous everywhere. That's not effective. I mean, you know, young people can, can feel it, can sense it, and that's something that we really need to, to work hard without giving them a kiss of death, giving, allowing, like in terms of government, without strangling the local religious, figuratively speaking, uh, 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 local religious community leaders, allowing them to do their work uh, behind closed doors. So that's very, very important. And empowering local grassroots, I think is very, very important. Um, in terms of the question, in terms of religion, absolutely. I mean, Daesh takes verses out of context. They have focused mostly verses out of context. They don't even, um, they focus specifically on the Medani. Our research has shown that they focus mostly on the Medani verses, which completely makes sense because it was the building of the, uh, of the state after the, the Hijra. They try to basically uh, provide uh, this similarity, which means like you need to immigrate, you need to leave your own nation state because there's no way, there's no alternative. You have to come to Daesh territory. It becomes a moral Muslim duty to, to move. And this is the role of religious leaders. It's not the role of international organizations nor of governments. It's really the role of religious leaders to provide an alternative. Uh, we have at the center, we've analyzed uh, almost 300 videos and we looked at all of the Quranic verses. It's online actually. I encourage you to go at the Carter Center. Um, and we've given this research to religious leaders. They don't have the time to look at uh, basically every video and say, okay, these are the verses that have been manipulated by Dash. So it's kind of a resource to say, okay, this is the resources that you can use in your own local context. And finally, to respond to all of this is, it has to be multifaceted. We cannot say we have to focus only on one particular area. It's very hyper-local. If you look at Daesh and the way they recruit young people, it really depends on the, the target audience that they are looking for. So for example, during Maryland, the police brutality against African Americans, they came out um, a poster in Tabiq on their online magazine, and it says, look at Wala and Bara versus American racism against their own black people. They were targeting America. And so we need to ensure that we are also hyper-local, that it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, and then I want to also conclude with a little story from one of the religious, a religious, a religious leader, an imam, a sheikh, who has almost 5,000 uh, uh, followers in his congregation on Friday, his khutbah. Salafi, very Salafi. And when we showed him some of the videos of Daesh, I was honestly shocked that a lot of these religious leaders have no idea how Daesh recruits. They think that most of their recruitment are rational, that, and that's what actually religious leaders have done. They have focused their responses on rational appeals. But Daesh is very emotional. A lot of the recruitment videos, a lot of their online communication is also emotional in terms of connecting with the youth and trying to build an identification. And so this, uh, this, this young imam, he's a very young imam, who's actually gonna be given another mosque because he has so many people praying that they are praying outside on Friday, who said, you know, now that I have seen how Daesh recruits, we are basically competing also with Sheikh Google, right? Which is what one of our experts said. And so basically they said, if this is how they're recruiting, it is our role 
to, you know, to try to respond to it. While he has very conservative views on particular, we might not agree on everything, he wants to make sure that in his khutbah, in his Friday sermon, which reaches 5,000 people, that he's able to respond to some of these critical uh, issues that Daesh raises, but not only rational, but also the emotional appeals, which I think is really missing in our religious uh, leaders. Thank you for that. We have about five minutes left. Um, I'm not going to do the 30 second thing to you, but I will give you a minute and a half or so. <laughs> to respond to? To these questions. Well, I mean, these are more comments, uh, really. I mean, I mean, what I'd like to say is that we don't necessarily need to think that religion itself is a problem. It can actually be an asset. And, and there's considerable research that demonstrates that empowering young Muslims in the Western European context with Islam helps to build resilience, confidence, etc. There was a, uh, something I, I was made aware of in Germany when I was there earlier in the year. A three-year initiative carried out by Hermann Kohl's government to um, look at the problem of German-born Turks who were sort of affected by racism and discrimination, but also intergenerational disconnect. They were falling through the cracks. And there was a worry that there was going to be problems of radicalization and extremism. And so one solution was, let's build a state-funded model of Islamic education to empower and encourage citizenship, etc. And all of that was well-tested and well-researched, but ultimately canned because of the political context, political environment. We, we see also in, 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 in the, again, the German analysis of the 20,000 or so uh, individuals uh, or, or, that were found, the, the, the data set that was recovered by the German intelligence services, that um, these young men, mostly men, have very little knowledge, if at all, of Islam. If they had a little, perhaps, it might help them to avoid uh, what they are doing. And what, the, what are they? They are paid assassins? Or are they religious extremists inspired by God for a mission that is a, the, their ultimate calling? I think there's a, a great deal of, of fuss and focus on religion as, a, as a, a source of the problem, but it can also be seen as a, a source for the solution. Thank you, Gulmina, for bringing up the issue of uh, legitimacy. Um, uh, you're right to a great extent, but I would say that we, you may lack legitimacy among the people who are questioning, we are attacking, because they are questioning the straight structure, they are questioning the social contract under which we are living, but they don't accept it. So it's a fight, it's a conflict between the people who don't accept the current state structure and those who are using their constitutional right to advocate the constitutional rights uh, for everybody living under that social contract and living in that state. So I think we should have the confidence to advocate our point of view. It, it, uh, and it carries uh, certain risks, but um, I think we have to stick our neck out. Uh, we don't have to ask anybody for legitimacy. Uh, we are very legitimate in invoking our fundamental constitutional right to tell the people this is what the constitution says. And the Constitution is a consensus, consensus document approved by more than two-thirds of the parliamentarians. It has existed as a, consist, uh, consist, uh, as a consensus document since 1973. Uh, yes, the, the aberrations, the distortions have crept in because the ruling elites themselves deviated from the Constitution, constitutional way. They partially have been complicit in putting the country down the path of religious extremism, uh, but this should not make us uh, be despondent. We have to, I think, continue our mission the way we deem it fit. Last word for USIP. All right. <laughs> um, so I think one of the things that's interesting to hear, there's, there's often a, a, a very understandable focus on, on Daesh, and so it's interesting to hear this, this topic of citizenship as an antidote because, of course, there are other contexts where, in fact, it's more of a nationalist movement, and although the Taliban use violent extremist tactics, it's almost more like a traditional conflict situation where there are two sides and both um, uh, restrict their claim to, Afghan, to the Afghan borders. And so this notion of citizenship and, uh, is, is inherently sort of entwined in the, in the narratives of both. And that comes to my, my closing point, which is this sort of 
issue of elite narratives um, and and this uh, um, the the issue of the messenger and so on and so forth that 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 Candace raised earlier. So there's no question that um, when narratives are being designed, even by, for example, the Afghan government, the Afghan government is essentially one side to this conflict, and therefore their narratives are not going to be seen as legitimate by the people who have been um, recruited or swayed by the narratives of the Taliban or other violent extremist groups. Um, and certainly, and this is applicable to the context of, of Daesh and applicable across the Middle East, Western governments um, are held as, as part of the responsible parties in this meta-narrative. And so, of course, the narratives that, that we can produce are also going to be met with the same level of criticism and not only may not be productive, but might actually be counterproductive in reinforcing the validity of the narratives being espoused by violent extremist groups. Um, and I think the, one of the last things I'll say is on this sort of language issue, one of the things um, that I, um, you know, kind of realized a little bit too late in the development uh, and analysis of narratives and counter narratives is that there isn't a word for violent extremism really in either of the Afghan languages. And so um, it was being interpreted as extreme violence rather than what we understand to be violent extremism. And so this, to tie it sort of back together, when we kind of impose uh, these narratives or come in with a sort of best practice without understanding that really granular nuanced local context, um, we may end up essentially making the situation worse. Let's hope not. I want to thank all of our panelists, um, and I also want to thank the audience. This um, concludes uh, the morning portion of our uh, event today, and I thank you all for coming out. I invite you to um, log in to resolvenet.org. Uh, many of the organizations, many of the speakers here you heard today uh, are featured there. Um, follow us. We're going to grow. Um, and we hope to see you next year uh, with a whole new platform uh, and uh, look forward to engaging with you in the future. Thanks so much.